Distinguished colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, it's my absolute pleasure and honor to address you today as the newly designated CEO of the Global Sepsis Alliance. Um, we had a, an amazing series of presentations and speakers and sharing of experiences earlier today, and I believe that the international track will also give the highlights of the um, ever-growing evidence, experience, and the lessons from the different settings of the countries, individuals, our patients, our professional um, colleagues and medical professional associations, and you will be finding those um, experiences and exchanges extremely informative and thought-provoking provoking for our future action. It's my delight to invite as the first speaker to the afternoon panel of International Trek, Mrs. Ilse Malfeit from Belgium, who is one of the strongest advocates and voices for sepsis from Belgium. Ilse, uh, going through the routine treatment to the hospital, her life completely changed after awakening from the weeks of coma and needs to going to go through a long rehabilitation. But since then, she has become one of the strongest voices. And I believe um, you will find her as one of the strongest persons we ever come to meet in our lives and professional paths. And um, from, with her book, Every Hour Counts, she is advocating in her country for adoption of the national sepsis plan and Ilse, you have our full support in your quest and the, the fight. Please join us. Hello, I'm Ilse. As you can see, my lower legs and fingers have been amputated. I also have an amputated breast. It all began with a small lump three years ago. Four days after my first chemo, I stumbled into hospital with severe abdominal pain in the dead of night without saying goodbye to my children. I was rushed into surgery. The inhuman pain the day after the operation was normal, the doctor said within seven days you will be home. Every morning, my youngest son Cass at the time, said, 10 at the time, said to my husband, within six days, mommy will be home, within five, within four, until he asked, will mommy be home tomorrow? My husband burst into tears. At that moment, I was being flown to University Hospital in an extremely critical life-threatening condition. My family heard for weeks that I would probably die within the next 24 hours. They gave me 1% chance of survival. Five weeks later, they brought me out of an artificial coma. My situation remained precarious. They've tried this before, and then I ha I've got a heart attack. It was the most emotional day of my life. I saw back my kids after five weeks, and I didn't, I didn't know if that was the last time, and I couldn't say goodbye due to the ventilation. My youngest, Son Cass pictured right, gave me his favorite stuffed dog that day. He was hugely attached to it. My husband and I had given it as a replacement for a real dog, his greatest wish. That wasn't an option due to our busy jobs. You can see his pale little face. A few minutes after this picture was taken, he fainted. This could not be from my pitch black fingers as they were tucked away with a flannel. Cass told me later that he was so shocked by my face. Thanks to a top medical team at the University of Ghent, I survived. 
the seven days foreseen became 487 emotional and sometimes terrible days. Sorry, I still shudder when I think of that time. I underwent 22 operations. The cancer was only fought with a mastectomy. Chemo was out of the question. Sepsis has weakened my heart too much. Every three months, I still go anxiously to the cancer checkups. Once back home, picking up the threads of my previous life proved more difficult than expected. I had had two time bombs in my body, sepsis and cancer. The contrast as a survivor of both was huge. Upon my cancer diagnosis, a war movement surged into action. I was contacted by breast nurses, given a tick tink ping full of cancer survival testimonials, and I still receive a beautiful quarterly magazine on how to move on as a cancer survivor. Sepsis that had freaked devastation and about which I had so many questions, hardly anyone knew. A cancer organization couldn't give answers. They told me that sepsis is not a problem in the Western world. My messages sent from my bed on the ward the day after my first operation confused me. I've sent in the morning, hell, I'm broke. And then two hours later, pain medication is increased finally. And then in the evening, problems, groggy, fainting, nausea, and oxygen deprivation. Pain, sleep medication, and sedatives are increased. The turmoil in my head around these messages had to stop, and I went back to the doctor of the initial hospital. He said loudly three times, I looked at your medical file and I would react in exactly the same way. The turmoil intensified. I plugged into my medical record and the notes of the first day were disturbing. I pick out two of them. Patient has been in hellish pain this night to the extent that she thought she would not survive. Madam is very groggy, nauseous, half a minute stuffed in the seat and unwell. Weren't these sepsis symptoms? I had to know, and I followed three sepsis conferences. The information I heard was so confrontational that I wanted to stop my search. My legs and fingers were lost anyway. And then I had an eye-opening visit. I met Cindy, Cindy, who is a friendly, strong lady who lost both legs as well as her right hand and four fingers of her left hand. Like me, Cindy is a mum of three and she has the same restlessness around sepsis. And above all, she seemed to be the sister-in-law of a colleague. The thousand sepsis victims, as I heard at conferences, came closer. And therefore, I continued my search. And I wondered if the foreign guidelines to detect critical patients would raise earlier alarm in my case. The results were shocking. All the criteria to detect critical patients early indicated that I was in the high risk zone 33 hours before the right medication was given. It took another three hours before I was transferred to ICU, completely confused with an abnormally low blood pressure of 60 out of 44. Every morning around four o'clock, I am tormented by phantom pain at my feet. In those morning hours, the words that many sepsis victims hear, I would react in exactly the same way 
echo through my mind. And then I think about the deafening silence around sepsis in Belgium. There is no national sepsis plan, no attention, no awareness, no data, and above all, no guidelines in many hospitals to detect critical patients early. That has to change. The Belgian government has to take action as the WHO prescribed in 2017. Our country's poor results shown by the study of the European Sepsis Alliance show that this is highly urgent. That change is the mission of Sepsibel. It's also the message of my book being published, published by the end of November, entitled Every Hour Counts. This picture gives me the strength to fight hard. I was still able to fulfill Kat's wish thanks to our black, black terrier, though many sepsis victims no longer have that chance, and that's not fair. Thank you for all the information that I found on your website to help me, that helped me during my search. I will be even more grateful if you will follow our Sepsibel Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn page to support our fight against sepsis. Thank you. Ilse, um, one thing that this should never have happened, definitely. The second that you have our full support in your fight for bringing the Sepsi Bell uh, goals. And um, thank you, thank you for being with us because this is, I believe, one of the most important interventions of the day. And um, you, you made us um, feel and see both the current challenges and the way forward that we have to be going to. Thanks immensely. Um, it's really difficult to continue uh, emotionally um, after Ilsa's presentation, but we have uh, a lineup of excellent speakers who will um, contribute to the richness of today's discussion. We have Donald Berwick joining us online. Dr. Berwick is the founder and president emeritus of uh, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and former administrator of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services in the United States. He has served on the faculty of the Harvard Medical School and Harvard School of Public Health, governing council and the Global Health Board of the Institute of Medicine and on the President Clinton's Advisory Commission on Consumer Protection and Quality and Care. Recognized as the leading authority on healthcare quality and improvement, Dr. Berwick was appointed Honorary Knight Commander of the British Empire by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Dr. Berwick, it's an honor. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> The honor is mine. Uh, let me first check to make sure that you can hear me adequately on this connection. Yes, we can hear you clearly. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I am absolutely delighted to join you virtually. The only thing I'm really disappointed about is that I can't be with you in person. I think what you are undertaking is of immense importance. I'm going to importance. I'm going to explain that a little more in my short remarks. Let me uh, say a word of uh, personal thanks to Conrad Reinhardt, who introduced me really to the work of the Global Sepsis Alliance and, and has now brought me up to speed on what's happening and what could happen. And uh, Ilsa, uh, I can only thank you for the um, generosity you show in bringing your story to all of us. Um, it's impossible to listen to you without making a firm commitment to uh, ending the scourge. Uh, I've worked on quality improvement in healthcare worldwide for over 40 years. Uh, and uh, sometimes the improvements remain quite elusive. 
there have been successes. The work you're doing brings to mind uh, probably the most thrilling episode in my quality improvement work back in the year 19, uh, 2004, when the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, the organization I led, launched the 100,000 Lives campaign. We were frustrated that progress was not being made against some of the clinical problems that could be solved. We had the science in hand. And so we created essentially a national campaign modeled on political campaigns, trying to affect the entire United States with outreach through 70 or 80 intermediary nodes and eventually uh, enrolled over 3,000 American hospitals in an effort over an 18-month period to save 100,000 lives by making six clear changes in care. We focused on changes related to the management of medication errors to uh, rapid response teams for deteriorating patients, six changes. I was absolutely stunned. The uh, outpouring of support uh, was the most moving episode really in my career as we saw people in these 3,000 hospitals say, all right, we'll get this done. Uh, we, we, we know how to do it. We're together. We'll do it transparently and we will um, save lives. It's not possible to say exactly how many lives were saved in that campaign, but the metrics we had showed more than 100,000 people who didn't die in an 18-month period due to the changes those hospitals made. Unfortunately, that episode remains relatively unique in my experience. It, it, it is difficult to get the momentum toward the kinds of improvements that Ilsa is talking about, but I'm going to give you the, the punchline to my whole talk already. And that is that I have never encountered since any opportunity in the improvement of healthcare worldwide in acute care, more compelling, more feasible, more ready for action than to end the scourge of sepsis. Uh, we have in our hands an opportunity that is nearly unparalleled. In the world of improvement that I engage in, um, there's some scientific principles principles like we have to act as a system. We have to work cooperatively together. We have to make changes and learn from those changes. But all that science really reduces to two basic ideas in the world of improvement, aim and method. Uh, with respect to aim, it's crucial. You, you, you generally don't improve either personally or systemically without something you care about, without, a, without an aim, without something to decide. The aim in our on our screens today, listening to Ilsa, is to end deaths from sepsis. Uh, nothing less than that. It's clear. It's important. It would affect the well-being of hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, certainly over time. Then there's method. And the method for improvement is change. Uh, decide what you want to accomplish. Track progress. You have to have a metric find changes, find find the things we're not doing now that would lead to the aim, and then put it to work, test it. If you're a child learning to ride a bicycle, you decide to ride the bicycle, you count the scratches on your knees, you study from friends how to ride a bicycle, then you get on the bicycle. Those are the basic elements of the world of improvement, aim and method. My closest colleague for most of my career who unfortunately died a couple of years ago, was a man named Tom Nolan. And Tom Nolan, who, by the way, helped write a book called The Improvement Guide, which I think all of you should read, basically. It's about the method of improvement. Tom uh, said, to achieve large-scale change in any system, in certainly healthcare, you need three basic as assets. He called them will, ideas, and execution. Will is the establishment of intention, uh, making the status quo uncomfortable as we all just felt listening to Ilsa and making the future attractive, uh, imagining a world without the amputations and deaths and suffering from sepsis that can be avoided, will. The second is ideas. How would you do it? How, how would you create a hospital free of complications of sepsis. What would that look like? What are the methods of doing it? Not exhortation, not yelling at people, not blaming people, not, not, not uh, you know, uh, 
exhorting a workforce, but actually putting in place the science in everyday action through guidelines, as Ilsa mentioned, through proper teaching, through metrics that are visible, and uh, through studying examples of success, those hospitals that have actually already achieved the aim, ideas. And then execution, which is the day-to-day -day work of making sure it happens. Will, ideas, and execution. In the IHI 100,000 Lives campaign, we had all three. Uh, we were able to generate a tremendous sense among the workforce and the executives of hospitals in America that it was possible to save hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, and we had the ideas. We knew six changes in care that would actually result in reduction in mortality. And the execution was done by creating a community of common effort, both within hospitals, among hospitals, say in American states, and nationally, where we had many, many celebratory events, learning events, um, everyone kind of coming together to, to take that hill, to climb that mountain, to achieve that goal, will, ideas, and execution. I find in the world of sepsis an enormous paradox because everything I've just told you is in place. Uh, the will, well, listen to Ilsa's story. There's hardly a physician or nurse uh, probably in the world, at least in, in countries that are that have structured healthcare systems that hasn't literally seen sepsis at work. It, it, and nor is it, is it um, the case that we can ignore the kind of information that Conrad and his colleagues have come forward with about the, the scale of this problem. Our will ought to be firm and, and strong and durable. Uh, ideas, we know what to do. The, 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 the guidelines for, for early detection of, uh, of patient deterioration, for early intervention on sepsis, and for the clinical management of incipient sepsis, they are now known, they're verified, they're validated by, science, by the scientific community. We cannot say we don't know what to do about this problem. And then execution, it, it should be possible locally. These are not, we're not asking people to, 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 to do the impossible here. This is basic medicine, basic processes, nursing processes, uh, physician processes, clinical processes, uh, which ought to be, we, we ought to be able to just do it. So why, why is sepsis not conquered yet? Um, I don't know the answer. I know that healthcare is very stressed today. I know that uh, it's hard for executives and clinical leaders to focus. They're always playing catch up with workforce shortages and the pandemic threat, of course. Um, they're always feeling like they're behind. Uh, standards can feel scary. We have sepsis standards. We know what to do, but for a workforce that's feeling a bit battered, the idea of standards feels like external pressure or control coming coming at us from outside, kind of loss of autonomy. Um, and, and unfortunately, there is a sense of inevitability uh, too much in our, in our clinical world uh, where people may regard the wages of sepsis as unavoidable despite the evidence, despite, despite what we know to do. This is what Dr. Joseph Duran, a great scholar in improvement, used to call unplugging the alarm system, disconnecting the alarm. And I think possibly with sepsis, we have done that. And then there are short-term costs to do the necessary training, to put the standards in place, to monitor, to test, to measure. There's money. There has to be some expenditure. I don't think it's vast, but in an economically stressed environment, it's hard to mobilize even small amounts of money. But the payoff, of course, would be enormous. Imagine a world without the complications of sepsis. Uh, imagine the savings, if you want to think economically in money terms, let alone human life and suffering. So I think it's a big challenge. Uh, we, have, we, ha it, we have everything we ought to need to end the wages of sepsis globally. Uh, can we learn now? Can we do it? Can we do better? I am absolutely sure we can. I've seen the mobilization of energy in other arenas. And as I told you at the start, I have never seen a problem in the clinical world more ready, riper, more, more mature, more available for action than the one that you are assembled in this meeting to discuss. We can imagine a future with no stories left like the, the, um, 
the story that Ilza had to, had to, had to tell us. What's going to take? I'll tell you what it's going to take. It's going to take solidarity together. Healthcare as an industry is it's drifting in my country and probably in yours. A sense in the workforce that we, you know, there's too much going on. We can't handle it. We're lost. The, the, the directions are unclear. And to some extent, at least in America, finance has taken over. We're, we're spending our healthcare energies not on caring for people, but on managing money. That can stop. It can stop when the kind of clinicians and uh, leaders assembled in that room in Berlin right now get together and decide that we are going to end this. And I personally believe it's possible. I wish that we could say that the year 2024 will be the year in which we have ended this scourge. If we establish solidarity, if we speak with one voice, if we are absolutely relentless about that message, if in every corner of, of healthcare in every country, this becomes a drumbeat, uh, I think we can offer Ilza not correction of the problem she's dealt with, but a promise that there will be so many fewer people who deal with it in the future. So I would say, let's come together. Let's fill a vacuum. Let's develop a, a unified international voice that this is a problem we will solve and we will do it um, with with a sense of urgency, pace, and at the end, be able to come to get together again in Berlin or Paris or New York, wherever you want to meet and celebrate the end of this scourge. Thank you very much for the chance to share some thoughts with you. I will assure you that I am with you. And I can't imagine the use of my personal time and energy are valuable to assist you any way I can in this uh, wonderful endeavor. Thank you very much. Dr. Burick, um, let me reassure you on behalf of the Global Sepsis Alliance and the co-sponsors of the the central World Sepsis Day event in Berlin, that we extremely highly value and appreciate your support. We know from Professor Reinhardt, the founding president of the, uh, the GSA, um, your commitment and passion to the, you know, the quality improvement, not only in the United States, but globally. And let us um, reassure you of our solidarity and readiness to collaborate for not only re reinforcing the current WHO resolution for sepsis, but really taking the global action on sepsis to the next level, the level that it deserves to be due to the human and economic burden of the, uh, the sepsis challenge. Thank you very much, and we look forward to future collaboration. Thanks. Um, dear colleagues, we are continuing our afternoon international track session with the fireside chat. Um, unfortunately, not every member of our panel would be able to join us in person, but we have the honor of uh, really distinguished colleagues and experts to be joining online, and we hope that we will have a successful uh, Q&A also session at the end of the first round of introductions. So let me greet Peter Bayer, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership. He um, He's coming from WHO as the Senior Advisor in charge of the WHO work on intellectual property and um, development of the tripartite collaboration with the WIPO and the World Trade Organization. Peter is a lawyer experienced in international negotiations, and he has played an instrumental role in establishing the Global Anti Biotic Research and Development Partnership, as well as AMR Action Fund. Peter, it's a pleasure having you online. Thank you. And before giving you the first two minutes of your um, introduction and feedback, let me specifically ask you, first of all, um, immense thanks. We are very grateful and delighted from the Global Sepsis Alliance that 
the Global Antibiotic Research and Development Partnership joined us as the official member and that we are already collaborating jointly on convening the first side event on sepsis and AMR on the margins of the UN General Assembly. So if you could explore more the reasons behind your decision to join the Global Sepsis Alliance and how you see our collaboration on synergizing the action between AMR and sepsis. Thank you. Thank you so much, Miriam, for having me. It's a great honor to be with you. Uh, I hope you can hear me well. And uh, I think, you know, the ask me is very simple to, to answer because I listened carefully to what Donald Burwick said. We are seeing this from sepsis. And that's why we joined the Global Sepsis Alliance. And that's why we are very happy and looking forward to do this side event at the, at the high level meeting in New York together on actually focusing our energy on ending deaths from sepsis. Um, as God P, we are part of this system that Donald mentioned. Donald, you said we need to act as a system. And we only contribute one piece to the system, which is actually the new treatments you need to to treat serious bacterial infections that are that are resistant to current antibiotics. And um, so we want to deliver this piece to the system. And the Global Sepsis Alliance is much more comprehensive. You are looking at prevention, which should be our first line of defense, because people actually shouldn't get these infections and shouldn't need the treatments that we are developing. But if it comes to that, then um, we want to be there and, and help actually to 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 end um to have hospitals that are free from sepsis to again call donald thank you peter uh, it's definitely extremely important and reassuring for the global sepsis alliance that you see our collaboration as a comprehensive approach and we definitely look forward and are ready for it stronger synergies of action. So let us wait for a better connectivity with Professor Welty and we will continue with our uh, next uh, panelist, Dr. Landgraf, who is coming with extensive experience in internal medicine and general as a general practitioner. Um, she has over 40 years of experience in primary health care, including her private practice as the general practitioner. Since 2023, Dr. Langreff uh, is the visiting scientist at the Charité and for years has been involved in professional politics in the Berlin Medical Association, General Practitioners Associations and other uh, professional networks. Dr. Landgraf, uh, based on your experience, extensive experience, how do you think we could improve the sepsis literacy among uh, the patients, the general public, and specifically among the general practitioners, the primary healthcare workers, the frontline workers, for early identification and interventions for effective sepsis management? Thank you. Thank you very much, um, dear colleagues. For me, it is very um, important that I have good contact to my patients, and not only to them, only uh, also for their to, to their families, to their daughters, sons, um, the parents. And um, so, it is really um, a little bit easier for me to um, detect symptoms who can be the first sign to uh, the sepsis. If somebody has an infection, I, for me it's important to uh, be in good contact, um, to hear what is the problem, to hear when it is uh, becoming worse than um, I normally uh, see it, and uh, so that I can react very quickly. And this is the way about um, how I, um, at last year's, no patient who died at sepsis. I was truly impressed when you shared your story during our informal discussions, and we believe that this is the experience that should be more um, multiplied, not only in Germany, but abroad, especially low and middle income countries. Thank you. Um, I also have a pleasure of inviting Dr. Tim Ekmans to the stage. 
Uh, Tim is the head of the Division for Healthcare Associated Infections, Surveillance of Antimicrobial Resistance and Consumption at the Robert Koch Institute, the German National Public Health Institute, and the head of the WHO Collaborating Center. He is the author or co-author of over 200 scientific publications. It's an honor, Tim, to have you on the stage. And um, based on the evidence that we have heard earlier today from Australia, UK, Germany studies, where we have a clear evidence that delay in initiation of antimicrobial treatment during sepsis increases the mortality risk of um, uh, from sepsis by 0.5% um, uh, on an hourly basis, and that there is a risk of failure in rescue. How you see the balancing of the AMR and sepsis uh, work, both at the institutional and national levels and within the WHO policies and uh, you know, um, infrastructure, including the um, institutional infrastructure? Yep. Thank you very much for this question and very important question. Uh, and I think uh, it's important to, to have not in view a uh, opposition of treatment with antibiotics or not treatment and, and dying of sepsis. I think this, we are with antibiotic resistance and sepsis have a lot in common. They are not in one discipline. They are going over all disciplines and, 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 uh, um, when you uh, when you treat a pair on and, and and then there's a question is there an opposition of antibiotic stewardship and uh, sepsis treatment because for sepsis it means you have to treat early and hard and in antibiotic stewardship but this is said in the same way antibiotic stewardship doesn't mean don't use antibiotics but uh, antibiotic stewardship means use antibiotics in the right way in the right moment and I think in I think there is no guideline where there is an opposition where there are, the the expert will say oh in this situation no antibiotic and the other say there's antibiotic I think it was a good example this morning or it was a bad example because it's almost cynical when someone says after someone died because of a sepsis oh no it was right not to give an antibiotic because it's uh, danger of resistance. This is completely nonsense because this is, of course, dangerous. And we know why we have, why we do antibiotic uh, stewardship because we have to use these antibiotics in the right moment. And this is the, the way to concentrate on. It, it might be in some situations, and I think in these situations it's it's important that the experts in this field come together and discuss discuss about this. There was this discussion, for example, last year in, uh, in Group A, Streptococci, when to treat antibiotic or not, because we had some more cases than usual in Germany, because there were much more cases of Group A Streptococci, and there was, I think, a very good discussion, but it was on, on this very balancing point, perhaps this exists very, but very seldom, and this is a real expert discussion where we can do this, but in, in general, it, it shouldn't be like this. And this is, I think, an, an, an opposition which is sometimes might f uh, make from outside, but it's not, it should not really exist. Um, Tim, we couldn't agree with you more that um, the comprehensive treatment of sepsis, including the bundles and the clinical pathways, it actually integrates clearly the effective antimicrobial stewardship. So again, um, just uh, to express readiness that um, we can collaborate very closely. Still, we have to develop the international guidance uh, on uh, the, the, the sepsis management overall, but this should be a joint venture of your support and of course the global antimicrobial uh, resistance and development co um, uh, partnership and we look forward to this opportunities uh, there yes because of the technical connectivity problems unfortunately we would not be able to hear from other panelists of our fireside chat but um, it would be uh, we, we would uh, take additional five minutes for the questions both from audience and if we have any questions coming from um, our online um, participants i would ask the administrative support to provide any questions that we have received through the messages any questions comments from the audience is most welcomed yes. 
Professor Reinhardt. What, what concerned me and also Dr. Model Link, uh, who is a, a children's book writer, and she wrote uh, a book uh, for, in the context of COVID, um, where she also advocated giving antimicrobials in case it's needed. And she was attacked by mothers who were scared. How can you advocate antimicrobials? And this is one issue which brought me to have such discussion because, Irmgard, as you know, we had lectures to physicians here in Germany in the context of our sepsis project and talking about sepsis. And these physicians raised the question, what about AMR? After we had brought up these stories that this is a time critical disease. And that's why it's my plea that we really look for these synergies because many, many, many more patients have died because they did not get any antimicrobials. And in case, also of Dr. Kreiner's case, where the diagnosis was made a seasonal summer flu and antimicrobials with health. So, so that is why it's so badly needed to address this uh, uh, together. That's thank my you, comment. Professor Reinhardt. Thank you. And I'm using the opportunity of thanking you for all the leadership um, you have uh, led for the global sepsis response. And it's an honor to be continuing the, the work. Similar question related to the link between antimicrobial resistance and sepsis management. And I wonder whether, do you know of any data from quality improvement projects within sepsis that have demonstrated improvements in antimicrobial stewardship and even resistance alongside sepsis improvement. That's also data which, which we need to be able to collect from sepsis improvement pro projects. I just, wonder whether you, I just wondered whether you know of any data. I, I ask also because in the UK, um, a couple of years ago, there was a quality improvement project linked around sepsis improvement, screening in hospitals and um, rapid action, administ administering antibiotics um, within uh, an hour of diagnosis. And what they saw in the UK was an improvement in outcomes, mortality, without an, an improvement in, without a worsening antimicrobial consumption. And at all, I wondered whether you had any other data uh, compared to the one in the UK. No, 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 thank you for this question. I think it's very important. And, and this is, and these results, I, like you described it, I, I think is w what I would expect. I don't know, and we, I, don't, I don't think we have studies like this done in Germany, but I expect really this, that, that quality improvement in sepsis treatment would probably not w worsen antibiotic use because it's in parallel, most times there is a good antibiotic stewardship uh, system in place and a good antibiotic stewardship system in place improves antibiotic use and not and 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 improves septic treatment as well and i really wonder if 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 often a doctor thinks of oh use i know an antibiotic or not and then he says no and this patient dies of sepsis because then it because this is most times such a situation that the per, per patient is so worth that this is this is, shouldn't be the the decision in this moment. So I I would expect something like this, but I don't know a study. But we don't have studies like this in Germany. Because there is data from US, and also Markus Friedrich might answer this question, and from UK that quality improvement uh, projects went along did not increase for any um, type of organism the uh, resistance situation. So that's for sure. If you allow me, I can contribute something from the studies we have done. Sure, Peter. Um, we have done an observational study on neonatal sepsis with where we enrolled 3,200 babies in, um, in 11 countries in Brazil, China, Thailand, Bangladesh, Greece, South Africa, Kenya, 
and we really wanted to know how, I mean, what are the bacteria that cause actually sepsis ultimately, and how are these babies treated? And we found out that the, the hospital has actually used over 200 different combinations of antibiotics, and most of them are not are not they have no indication you know for babies and not for the related infections so it was often treatment which was not adequate for what these babies actually needed so i don't think that amr the amr agenda and the sepsis agenda are, are in opposition i think they run in parallel we want now we we started a clinical trial where we are testing different combinations where we want we, we want to find a better combination that can, can be used actually to to save these babies and where there is actually data that that clinical data that proves that this is the right treatment and we also developed the new se um, severity score which actually should help neonatal units to detect earlier which babies are at risk to develop sepsis so that they are, can be treated early before they actually get sepsis and again this is totally aligned with your with your agenda of the Global Sepsis Alliance. And um, and ultimately, as, as Tim said, it probably would also lead to less use of antibiotics and more rational use of antibiotics. And that means it would also drive less resistance. Thank you, Peter. And I believe this is a great start of our closer work and discussions of uh, synergizing actions and actually developing the much needed guidance. I think the uniqueness of the global sepsis response is that despite the fact that <clears throat> sepsis disproportionately affects low and middle income countries, it's still a challenge of every single country, irrespective of the level of the income and the strengths of the national health system. So this is the fight where we are absolutely together and we look forward to, to close the collaboration. Thank you. We also have a pleasure of uh, uh, having on our panel Dr. Sibyl Model-Link, who is the pediatrician by training, but she, she became renowned author since the publication of her first medical children's book, Frau Doctor Has a Bird. Since the publication, Dr. Model-Link has been traveling throughout the German-speaking world with her puppet comedy and providing health education to children in an entertaining and innovative way. So it's a pleasure and uh, it would be lovely to have the opportunity of um, also a performance at the, the Berlin um, event. But thank you first of all very much for all the work you're doing and we would love to hear your experience, how we can improve uh, and expand the sepsis literacy both among children and their families and parents thank you thank you very much uh, do you hear me yes. yes thank you um i'm very sorry for the technical problems but i'm here now <laughs> and i'm uh, very happy and uh, thank you very much for the invitation um the uh, health literacy with children is especially um it's, it's very demanding because um, you have to bring the um, amount of um, knowledge and um, the um, very um, severe topics down to how the children can understand it. So this is the main um, target I'm working at to just simplify things that even children can understand it. Um, as you just said, um, Frau Doktor hat einen Vogel, it was my first book um, 12 years ago. But uh, since then, I had a lot of um, readings with puppets for children with my first aid book. And there, there is um, one scene where you can see the sepsis. <laughs> Well, it's actually, um, I'm very sorry that I can, I'm not sure I can, uh, will be able to show you the picture as big on the screen that you can see it. I, I'll try this later. Um, but you can see there that um, the bacteria are very fierce, um, not looking like under the microscope, uh, of course, because they're more personalized. 
and um, so that the children can understand the severity of the topic. And there is another book which will be presented at the uh, Frankfurt Book Fair, you can see here. <laughs> there you can see um, some of the germs and bacteria, also very um, personalized, so the kids can understand emotions with this. <laughs> this is, of course, a very um, uncommon approach to present it to the children in this way. Do you have any questions for me? Um, first of all, we completely agree that simplifying the message is an already difficult for policymakers without medical background. <laughs> and <laughs> simplifying the message for children um, is, I don't know, an enormous task. So um, we've heard about your experience. Professor Reinhardt just mentioned that there has been a resistance from parents when you were speaking about antibiotic treatment. So could you explore that further? Uh, well, in uh, one of my books, uh, which is called In meinem Körper ist was los, there is um, the um, mentioning of the use of antibiotics when the body's police, as I call uh, the lymph lymphocytes and leukocytes, um, if they can't cope with the situation or if they're overwhelmed or um, starting to act how they're not supposed to act, as we know in uh, sepsis is the case, then um, there was a sentence that in this case that um, the body defense doesn't know how to cope with such an amount of bacteria, um, antibiotics might be needed. So this was just a line in the book. And uh, in the um, Amazon feedbacks, there was one parent who was, uh, who was very much against it. And um, that was the direct... Um, feedback I was I was given to antibiotics. Uh, normally in my readings there are mainly kids or um, kindergarten teachers and teachers. So um, if I get responses, I get them in um, readings I'm doing op in, in an open session where they're also the kids are accompanied by their parents and grandparents and sometimes they will say well are you sure but you shouldn't you shouldn't use antibiotics uh too much which i totally agree you shouldn't <laughs> use antibiotics too much if not needed if not needed that's that's the important thing about it but you should think about it that maybe sometimes it's mandatory you can't go without because it would be life-threatening. So this is a balance um, which is very <laughs> difficult even for us uh, as medical doctors, as medical professionals who are prescri prescribing the antibiotics. It's um, always, we don't want to treat something which is we should not be treated with antibiotics, but we should see when there are alarm signs that it could go into the, the direction of sepsis and then we have to treat it. And we, we are uh, very lucky to have the antibiotics in those cases. So this is the thing, it's, it's not only black and white. <laughs> um, even kids can understand that in some certain circumstances um, we have to act as doctors and we have to help absolutely and i think that's a wonderful concluding message for our panel finding the fine line balancing and synergizing our action both in clinics and policy work and with educating children and their uh, families
Thanks very much, Peter. Thank you. Uh, and I'm also grateful to our beautiful um, uh, panel. So um, we look forward. It's just the beginning of a stronger <laughs> co collaboration. Thank you. I have the honor of um, moderating our next <clears throat> session, the need for holistic quality improvement in infectious management strategies. And uh, mindful of our time limitations, I will go um, straight forward um, without much ado, inviting our next speaker on the afternoon is our esteemed colleague, Emmanuel uh, Tsutapu a consultant infectious disease physician and a clinical professor at Khalifa University, joining us from Abu Dhabi, United Arab Emirates. Uh, Emmanuel is the chair of the African Regional Sepsis Alliance, and we have been already communicating very intensively. Thank you very much for all the work you've done in the region, and uh, please welcome for your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be speaking here today. And how time flies, because it's, it's over a year, just about a year, uh, we were in Berlin at the last, at last conference. Really a pleasure to be here. I've been asked to talk about a strategy for the improvement of sepsis care in resource limited settings. And uh, I'm going to focus on Africa, but the messages and the principles are the same really for all low and middle income countries, but the example I will use is, is Africa. Today, whilst listening to the stories, the patient stories, and also Isley's uh, story, it also reminded me of my own story, and um, I also lost somebody in 2003, Delphine, in 2003, and she was pregnant with a set of twins. And some of the framework I'm going to use here is a framework from a book which I also wrote, about turning struggles into success. And it's based a lot on the reflections of what happened to Delphine and what we've done since then to improve sepsis care in Liverpool, in the UK where I used to work, in the UK National Health Service and in African Sepsis Alliance. So let's start with the framework. When you're faced with a complex problem, I have a habit of being involved in complex problems, one of which is sepsis. The first thing you need to do is you need to get clarity. You, solving a problem without understanding it is like punching in the dark. You will hit the wrong target. So the first step is developing clarity. Clarity, understanding your problem. And that takes me to why we need to focus on sepsis in low and middle income countries. At the moment, you've seen beautifully described throughout the day the disequilibrium we have with high burden of disease for sepsis in low and middle income countries, but least amount of improvement activities in low and middle income countries. And that's imbalance which we need to overturn. And I'll remind you again of this, uh, this um, um, picture which uh, I think Dr. Um, uh, Professor Conrad showed you from the Lancet Burden of Disease Report showing quite nicely highest burden of disease for sepsis in low and middle income countries such, and, such as the African continent with um, incidence of sepsis per 100,000 over 2,500 per 100,000 in some parts of, of, of Africa. It's a really significant problem. And same similar for, for Asia and also uh, in, in, in parts of the Middle East. If you look at mortality, it's the same picture. Highest mortality in low and middle income countries Again, Africa, African continent in the middle, with all with red, and similar redness around Asia, and also Latin America, high um, mortality. If you look at mortality, rather than looking at number of deaths per 100,000, as in this graph, if you look at it in terms of 30-day mortality, you see a, 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 a similar picture. Over the day, you've heard about mortality for sepsis in, in Europe and North America, ranging between 20 to 30%. Well, in the African continent, publications in the African continent describe 30-day mortality of over 50%. So if you get into an, a hospital in Africa, it's a 50-50 chance of survival with sepsis, significantly higher than other parts of the world. If you look at high-risk population, 
And sepsis in Africa is different and in low middle income countries in that the high risk population is different. So sepsis in low middle income countries mainly affects children, young adults and pregnant women. And so if you look at children mortality from sepsis globally, around 300,000 deaths globally from sepsis, the majority are in low and middle income countries, over 80%. If you look at mortality for, for pregnant women, 130,000 deaths every year, over 99% of deaths are also in low middle income countries. And whilst in Europe, mortality for sepsis mainly affects the elderly and people with comorbidity, in low and middle income countries, it's young. In addition to that, we have real differences with, of sepsis in low and middle income countries. The host is different, the pathogens are different, health seeking behaviors are different, healthcare system is weaker, there isn't much data, the interventions that we use for sepsis care in high income countries are not necessarily the same interventions that make a difference in low and middle income countries. And so we need to address it in a different way and we need data to be able to do that properly in low and middle income countries. So having had some clarity about the problem of sepsis in low middle income countries, the next bit is, the next step of solving a major challenge is commitment. And this is where we, we are lacking, the urgency. It's making sure people understand that status quo is no longer acceptable, and that we need to move from a state of A to B. And the frustration you've all shown today is, is this, there isn't commitment. We know the problem, but there isn't commitment. And this is where we need to focus on. And the mission of the African Sepsis Alliance is to provide leadership to reduce the suffering and mortality related to sepsis in Africa. And unfortunately, despite the WHA resolution 2017, there's been very little traction in low and middle income countries. And that is because there's lack of commitment. And the frustration you see in Germany is even worse than the frustration in low and middle income countries, lack of commitment. And so where do we need to change the commitment in the, in the regional alliances in the continent? The commitment is needed from local regional associations. And for Africa, these are the three main ones. It's Africa CDC, African Union, and WHO Afro. Without those, we're not gonna have large scale improvement in sepsis care in, 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 in the regions, in low middle income countries. And the same applies for Asia, the same applies for Latin America where it's needed. Having got clarity and commitment, which we need, the next step in really change, bringing about significant change is we need collaboration. We need to build a team, essentially. And that team is not just a team within the Global Sepsis Alliance or the African Sepsis Alliance, it's the wider team of stakeholders. And that is also something which we, we need to work on. In the African Sepsis Alliance, we have 15 countries across Africa that are involved in, our, in the alliance. And I've put in green, the Sudanese Sepsis Alliance. Sudan is green because that was, that was our exemplar country. And you, you're going to hear from Mohammed in, at the end of this session because the work that was going on in Sudan has been destroyed by war. And so we no longer had, have that light we had in Africa, which was coming from Sudan. With a strong alliance, patients involved, linked to the ministry, Medical students also involved the, the university, and that is really being destroyed. But there is hope, even in, in, the, in the presence of war. So what is lacking in terms of the team? What is lacking is we do not have the right team, especially ministries of health. So the frustration you have in Germany is even more frustration in low and middle income countries, in the continent. At the moment, apart from Sudan, where there was some ministerial involvement, the other countries do not have ministerial involvement and policymakers are not yet involved in sepsis improvement in low and middle income country, countries. We don't also have high profile patients and stories from low and middle income countries. You've heard a lot of the stories today. We lack those in, in, in low and middle income countries in the African continent. And the team which we're using in terms of regional alliance the team is we don't have dedicated people with time to do the work that's needed where the problem is. And so it's not surprising that we're not having enough traction, but going forward with the help of the Global Sepsis Alliance and with Mariam now, we're hoping that we will get that traction and dedicated leads and time to be able to bring about change. Having developed this, the team, the next main step is you need a plan. 
A planning um, action without planning is planning to fail. Failing to plan is planning to fail. And one of the questions that always get asked by policymakers is, what, you tell me what is sepsis, how does it really fit with everything we're doing? And, and then it ends up with, we're probably doing sepsis anyway. We're doing antimicrobial resistance, we're doing, so we're doing it anyway, so what, it, what else? And so the first bit I want to focus on is how we conceptualize sepsis improvement, because that's something we've given a lot of reflection on, on, about in this African Sepsis Alliance. And our focus with sepsis improvement, with the discussions you had today, is in the middle, recognition and treatment of patients with sepsis initially. And that's where you've, see, you've seen all the mishaps. So it's about strengthening the health system to ensure that it can identify and treat severely ill patients, sepsis included. And that has also benefits for response, identifying and response to emerging infections, which is a real issue in low and middle income countries, like dealing with Ebola and, and COVID, etc. But post-discharge care, just as it's important in the West, it's also important in low and middle income countries. And in Africa, there have been a lot of studies in adults and in children showing the worsening mortality and also morbidity after discharge from hospital. So the focus is around in the middle and post-sepsis care, but it's also linked to the first bit, which is prevention. And a strategy for sepsis improvement has to have the, the first bit about vaccination, improving vaccination, linked to antimicrobial resistance and stewardship, as we've mentioned here, infection prevention and control, and also um, improving patient safety and, and uh, access to water and sanitation. And so the strategy for sepsis improvement really has to focus on four main areas, advocacy, education and training for members of the public, as well as for healthcare workers, improving care by strengthening health services, which is our, our foundation, but also improving data, research, and evidence, because there is very limited evidence and data from low and middle income countries. The data from the Lancet Infectious Disease, Infectious uh, Lancet uh, um, Burden of Disease report on sepsis was actually extrapolated to Africa. It was not data from Africa. It was from other parts of the world, extrapolated to Africa. So we need that data. And then we have to also focus on high risk groups. So those are the four sort of shields of improvement. And then that takes us to the last bit, which is creating action. As um, Professor Berwick mentioned, this is where the magic happens. This is execution. And um, we, without a plan, executing is a dream. But with a plan and, and executing well, then we can bring about change. And in terms of the African sepsis lines, we have an, what we refer to as an actionable strategy. And I'll whiz through our actionable strategy to highlight how it's linked to in understanding the problem, our, our um, team and building commitment as well as a plan. The first is advocacy. We, we, we'd, we'd like to improve advocacy and awareness amongst members of the public, policymakers, WHO, African Union and CDC. And so our main objective is sepsis to be declared as a national and continental priority. In, in, Af in the African continent, as well as the other regions. And then identify patients and high profile people that we can work with as advocates for sepsis, just as you've seen happen today. The second is national action plans. There is no country in Africa at the moment with a national action plan. A, the continent with the highest burden of disease doesn't have any country with a national action plan. And that is something we need to change with a template, an implementation guide and working with national technical working groups to make to turn that around and that is a crucial part of, of it and that should lead to high um, large-scale quality improvement projects on sepsis across the continent and then the who as um, we i think we, we will hear um, is working on guidelines on for sepsis and so we want to we're going to be linked to that in terms of dissemination dissemination of those, those guidelines with our stakeholders in africa when they are developed and then research is a crucial part of our of our strategy um with um also obtaining data that will help us to decide on which interventions are appropriate for uh, um, for the continent and there are a number of research studies the african research collaboration on sepsis and the stairs uh, research project which you know from the federal uh, sponsored by the federal government uh, in, in germany and we so one important part is ensuring that sepsis is included as a quality indicator for healthcare in across countries You've heard that discussed today here, 
uh, why sepsis should be a quality indicator. And so for us, there's an, also a major change that needs to happen. A hospital, a healthcare system that can look after a patient with sepsis will also be good at looking after any patient with severe illness or any patient with an emerging infection. So in summary and to close, sepsis is responsible for a high burden in low and middle income countries, such as the African continent. We need urgent and collective action and our focus and where we need movement is on commitment, real commitment for change, and also getting the right stakeholders around the table to bring about the change. And we also need leadership from local institutions. We do, it's not help we need from Europe, it is help we need from institutions in Africa to get involved. The resources are actually there. We, it's not resources that we need, it's involvement of institutions in the continent. And our priority in terms of strategic areas for action and national action plans, declaring sepsis a national, uh, an emergency and priority for, for Africa, and then including sepsis as an indicator for quality um, of care. And I'll stop there and take any questions if they are at the end. Thank you. Thank you, Emmanuel. Indeed, an excellent, a very comprehensive presentation bringing the clarity as the first step to many of the challenges that uh, we're facing. And um, with the urgent call for stronger collaboration from WHO and the guidance, both in terms of national strategic planning templates and the gui guidelines, we would like to welcome online the uh, leader of the Clinical Services and Systems Unit in the Department of Integrated Health Services at WHO, Headquarters in Geneva, Terry Reynolds. Uh, we just, it's important to highlight that unit brings together for the first time WHO's work on integrated delivery channels, starting from primary care through palliative care and with focus on effectiveness of organizations and people's management across the health uh, systems. Terry, welcome, and um, I hope you can hear us well. Thanks very much. I can hear you perfectly. Wonderful. Thank you. The Great. I'll go ahead and share my screen. And while I'm doing that, I just really want to thank um, the, the most recent speaker for the call to action and specifically for the specificity of that call. Um, we do a lot of thinking about how exactly we can engage in such a way that we amplify these efforts. So um, are you able to see my full screen now with the presentation? Yeah, it looks like you are on the video. I can't hear you, but it looks like you are. So I'll just go ahead. So, um, you know, WHO plays a lot of different roles at different levels. You know, one role at the global level, another at the regional, another at the country. But fundamentally for sepsis, our role is to facilitate action at regional and country level, because that is really where we are going to have impact and change the course of the disease. So I want to look at the activities that WHO is doing. I was asked to consider sepsis specifically in the context of universal health coverage. So I will focus on that and I'll start with that. But what I would like to do is go through and look at the WHO action on sepsis from the level of World Health Assembly down through universal health coverage and specifically the packages of services that countries design for universal health coverage, then to the pathways that need to be followed to ensure appropriate continuity of care and timely care for people with sepsis, because as we know well, and as others have mentioned, that is really where the battle is won or lost for sepsis. Um, and then also look at three other things quickly that I see working together to improve the quality of sepsis care. And again, these are all WHO tools designed to support the efforts of all of you in the room. So first of all, you all know the sepsis resolution, so I won't spend time going back to that, but it's been a very powerful advocacy platform for the work that all of us do. Um, we, I want to flag this one because it's out of the most recent World Health Assembly. This is now resolution 76.2 on integrated emergency critical and operative care, so eco-care for universal health coverage and protection from health emergencies. 
One of the reasons this is so important is it emphasizes for the first time the integrated continuum of emergency critical and operative care. And that is exactly the continuum of services needed to move from early recognition to definitive treatment for sepsis. So I flag this for you as a new and renewed mandate that calls out the sepsis resolution in addition to a number of others, but it renews our mandate and brings it into the present. Um, and that is usually quite effective at getting attention from governments and partners to say uh, there is a longstanding mandate, but there is also a renewal of this mandate from all of the countries that has come through this new resolution. So I mentioned that. Second, one of the most powerful policy mechanisms that we have to address a condition like sepsis, and this is the core of what I was asked to address today, is this idea of universal health coverage. Now, universal health coverage, everybody agrees that it's a good thing. Nobody is against universal health coverage. But what's important is that it can be quite an abstract concept. And what we need in order to have the idea of universal health coverage help support effective action for sepsis is to work through the national packages of services for UHC. So countries define a set of services that they intend to be universally available to everyone, that they as a government make a policy commitment to protect. And what we need to do is to make sure that the services that allow effective response to sepsis, that these are included in these packages. Here you see the package building tool that we have at WHO, happy to share this. The, um, the goal has been here, this CUC, for example, initial management of shock to make sure that if that's the entry point to sepsis, that is managed, but also that the specific syndrome of sepsis is called out and that all of the interventions needed can be assigned to the appropriate platforms. The early simple interventions like IV fluids at outpatient level, the higher level interventions at higher levels of the health system. So now when a country works with WHO through its flagship tool, to define a package of services for universal health coverage, they are immediately confronted with sepsis. And given that, every country that I have worked with has chosen these specific services for sepsis to be included in their package. So again, no one is against care for sepsis, but it's a matter of keeping it on their radar and putting it front and center in these higher level policy agendas. Here you see also the detailed sources on a range of infections. Um, and this is what is needed for source control, obviously, of sepsis. And these is this is just to show that the tool goes down to a really detailed level of information on what are the tasks needed to address these conditions? What are the products needed to address these conditions? What are the health workers needed to address these conditions? And then links it specifically and directly within the tool. You can click on these links and get directly to the WHO guidance. So this is one of the powerful mechanisms we have for addressing sepsis, but more importantly, for supporting your efforts to address sepsis. And this is just to show you what the data behind this looks like. And these exports can be done. It covers the relationships to programs, platforms, medications, et cetera. So that's one thing. So now we've looked at advocacy uh, from a resolution level. We've looked at UHC as a powerful policy mechanism, but specifically how to make that concrete to ensure that the services needed to care for people with sepsis are in those UHC packages. Um, and now I wanna drop down one more level to say just having the services doesn't give you all of the process that you need. So I wanna quickly show you a, um, project that we have that is about pathway readiness and with appreciation to the Global Sepsis Alliance who've been working on us, working with us on this and reviewing the sepsis content. What this tool does very simply, it allows a country to look at the status of the clinical functions that are needed. What does the system need to do to address sepsis or a specific condition? And then it lets them say, are we doing that adequately or only partially or not at all? 
then to select what are the barriers, what's causing the problem, and what do we need to do to fix it. So the output of this is not an assessment, but is actually an action plan so that it converts intention and interest very quickly to action, which I honestly see as the main role of WHO to, to really facilitate the conversion of interest and policy intent into action. So here you see just on the landing page, there is a general acute care pathway, but there is specifically a sepsis pathway. What happens is, is a country comes into a given location in the pathway. I'm only gonna quickly show you one or two examples and very happy to follow up with anyone who would like. But if you go into the emergency unit, you get specific functions. What does the system need to do to be able to address sepsis? As soon as you mark whether you can do something partially or not at all, if it's anything other than adequate, it asks you why. What is your barrier to being able to do that function well? And then specifically, what would you like to do about that barrier? Because two different countries can have the same problem without having the same solution. And then, as I mentioned, just to show you quickly, the output here is a plan of the actions that you want to take. And you can view it by location, such as the inpatient critical care unit, the emergency unit, the community, or you can view it by category. What is the training we need to do? What is the equipment we need, um, et cetera. Okay, so those are those levels. So now we've come down from the assembly resolution level to the UHC policy level to the pathway level. And now I just quickly wanna show you three tools that we have found to be effective when we have done outcome evaluation at improving outcomes. So very concretely, ways that you can improve care of people with sepsis. Um, and none of this, we know what works. This is a very important message. We know what works with sepsis care. Where we're failing is at the dissemination of these. So this is our academy course on basic emergency care. It is action reaction, very interactive, very much intended for frontline providers. This is a similar learning program for critical care. Again, action reaction, very practical, interactive, and designed to support the provision of critical care with a particular focus on limited resource settings. Next, I wanted to show you all flash. I know this is too much information in too short a time, but the only goal here is to make you aware as I was asked to of what's there, and then we're very happy to follow up. So another key process that determines whether we win or lose the battle against sepsis is triage. Another one is a systematic approach to every patient. We know this very well. This is not well understood across all health areas, but those of us who work on sepsis, we know this a systematic approach to early recognition, such as through checklists, such as through pro sepsis protocols, um, are what delivers for conditions like sepsis and also for certain others like injury. Um, all of these tools and pathways that I just showed you are integrated into something called the, the sepsis learning program, the WHO sepsis learning program. So this is a way to bring together these things if your entry point is sepsis. What we want is no matter what your entry point is, is it the assembly resolutions? Is it UHC? Is it emergency care? Is it critical care? Or is it sepsis? We want you to arrive at effective, comprehensive care for people with sepsis, no matter what your entry point is. So this is something that just draws a different boundary around the same resources that I've just been showing you. And again, with an emphasis on recognition, resuscitation, referral, um, and also with attention to processes as well as clinical content. And then another thing to support the quality is our, some of you know, our WHO clinical registry for other reasons. Right now, it is configured around general emergency cases and injury. We're looking at a dedicated sepsis case module. But just to say, um, I won't spend time on the details right now, but this is an open access resource free to users in which countries own their data and they have complete control over who sees their data. Um, and this is hopefully will amplify many of your efforts to understand what is actually happening to people with sepsis. So we found that one of the biggest barriers to countries with limited resources to being able to do effective quality review of their sepsis cases was that every time they did it, they had to build a new platform. 
Um, and so that was just one very expensive investment that was not available to support the really good efforts of people who know exactly what needs to be done in these settings. Um, and then uh, finally, I'll just give you one last line, a quick update on the WHO guidelines of sepsis management because they were mentioned. I'm very happy to show, as you know, because we were put on a pathway of uh, managing the COVID response, generating an enormous amount of dynamic gu uh, guidance for COVID in particular, um, the process that we had committed to some time ago was slowed for actual guidelines on sepsis management. That has now been fully reactivated, and I'm very happy to say I just received today the full approval of the from the guidelines review committee of the um, sepsis, the clinical management of sepsis guidelines development plan. So what that means now is that we are approved fully by the GRC with our committee convened to move forward and produce these guidelines. This is our tentative timeline right now, and I appreciate all your patience. We're very aware that these have been very much needed, um, and we are now in a very solid place in terms of producing these guidelines as quickly as possible for you. And I, I really appreciate the comments so far about everyone's willingness to engage and help us disseminate these guidelines. And I would just say I really welcome your direction on what you need from WHO. So as you can see, we've tried to act at each level, but please, please ve be very directed with me about what you feel like we can do that is value add as WHO in particular. Thank you very much for your time and for involving me in this. Thank you. Dr. Reynolds, uh, let me thank you on behalf of the Global Sepsis Alliance as the newly designated CEO and uh, all the co-sponsor agencies of the World Sepsis Day, the central event. It's, um, uh, we, we really highly appreciate that since 2017, the global sepsis community has been waiting for WHO guidance on sepsis and to see the WHO learning modules have been established and the guidelines are under development is extremely reassuring. And we, we are not only ready to support you in dissemination, but I would like to reaffirm our readiness in co-creating the guidelines based on the experience of the five regional sepsis alliances and 120 member organizations of the global sepsis alliance across the region including some of the very effective evidence-based pathways and bundles that have worked in many of the countries and th that is the knowledge from the global sepsis alliance that we would be delighted and honored to bring to who and work together more closely Thank you very much. And um, after your presentation, we are moving to um, the, the example of the, the National Clinical Pathways uh, with the Red Flex Sepsis Recognition Tool and the Sepsis 6 Treatment Pathway developed by the Vice President of the Global Sepsis Alliance and the National Health Services Consultant in, in Intensive Care, Dr. Ron Daniels. Ron is the founder and chief executive officer of the UK Sepsis Trust. Ron, we believe yes. you are online and you can hear us clearly. I am indeed, I can hear you. The host has disallowed me from sharing my video at present, but uh, it's very nice to be here and I shall continue to try to share it as I conduct my presentation. So uh, thank you for the kind introduction. I will move straight to a presentation Ah, there we go, start my video, there we go, excellent. And I hope and anticipate that you can see that. So of course, we all know what we're talking about. And whilst I was asked to talk about the synergies between national and global strategies, like my friend Emmanuel, who presented a couple of um, uh, presentations ago, I'm going to talk about where my expertise lies, which is trying to affect change in a country like the United Kingdom. Now, I think there are lessons that can be drawn uh, for other countries wanting to initiate sepsis improvement programs. And there's also themes that are going to be similar. And these themes will remain broadly the same, whether we're in a high income country or a low to middle income country. But just a reminder of the scale of this problem from a visual perspective in a country like the UK. So we have a population of 67 million people, very much similar to the country that you're in today in Germany. And 
sepsis is estimated to affect 48,000 people in the UK. Now, breast cancer claims around 11,000 lives in the UK, bowel cancer, 48,000 lives lost. Sepsis is estimated by the IHME, and these data have already been shared, to claim 48,000 lives every year, more than breast cancer and bowel cancer and prostate cancer put together, which gives us a really good opportunity for the first theme that I think is common to most countries, which is around advocacy. And the sepsis resolution has been mentioned when back in 2017, we persuaded the WHA to adopt the resolution on sepsis on behalf of the WHO. We wrote an opinion piece in one of the journals and we asked the former UK chief medical officer to write a forward. And Sir Liam Donaldson said, some very important clinical issues, some of them a matter of life and death exist in a backwater inhabited by academics and professionals and enthusiasts. But that the public and political space is where these things need to be in order for things to change. And Sir Liam went on to cite examples such as HIV and AIDS as examples of where public advocacy is needed. And this is something that can be achieved anywhere. So I'll show you a few examples of what we've done within the UK. There are other examples from other countries, but these can be delivered in smaller countries with fewer resources. And one example that I often talk about is the radio campaign in Burkina Faso aimed at children in rural areas of that country uh, and educating them uh, and their carers around the risk of sepsis. And it was estimated to save several thousand lives over a three year period. So we have a national ambulance service that supports the national NHS. And across the UK now, we have sepsis messaging on the side of ambulances. Now, no one pays for this. Our ambulance services have to provide livery to a certain proportion of their vehicle space, and they just chose to livery it with life-saving messaging. We have large format messaging in city centres. We empower the public to just ask, could it be sepsis? And again, there are examples from other countries, both high income and lower income. We work with large organisations. So some of them large corporate and commercial organisations, some of them like this, a sports club, to use their existing dissemination strategies to get the message out um, to their fans, as is here, to their clients, to their staff base, to empower people. And this month for World Sepsis Day, we're launching across Amazon in the UK, Microsoft in the UK, and some very large multinational corporates in the UK. We're launching a set of sepsis savvy resources that they can use to safeguard their members. Again, these are low cost activities that can be delivered and must be delivered. We have to ensure that our public are empowered to access healthcare promptly, to know when to access healthcare, and to advocate for each other. And we'll continue to work with television programs uh, and the like to raise awareness. And that's one of the reasons I can't be with you today. And apologies for that. I've been in government today. I'm going to Westminster again tomorrow, but also on the BBC Breakfast News Show tomorrow to raise much needed awareness around sepsis. Now, we've had some big stories in the UK over this last week. This was a young girl. She was only 12 years old when she died in one of our leading hospitals in central London. And the health professionals there did not listen to her mother. Her mother was very concerned, said, might this be sepsis? I'm worried my daughter's deteriorating, but the health professionals did not listen to her. Unfortunately, Martha went on to die. And one of the last things she said to her mum was, I don't think they can fix this. I think I'm dying. We have to get better. Whatever country we're working in, at working in partnership between public who are empowered to just ask, could it be sepsis, and health professionals, not only who think sepsis and are trained in recognizing and treating it, but also who know how important it is to listen to families. Now, it was mentioned uh, by Mariam just now that we were going to talk about the screening process. And, and thank you to Terry for the excellent presentation around the evidence-based strategies. But sometimes busy junior health professionals on the front line don't need academic publications. They don't need academic guidelines. They need operational tools. And it's this strategy that I think is critically important, whichever country we're working in. Yes, we have to have the rigorous process, the grade methodology behind the creation of academic guidelines, but then we have to distill them into something a busy junior health professional can deliver rapidly. Because 
they're faced with an undifferentiated cohort of patients in a chaotic environment. They need simplicity. So in the UK, we have a standard approach. It uses our national early warning score as the trigger point to screen for sepsis. We then qualify it with, we think it could be due to an infection. And then we go on and look for a red flag. And although to any non-clinicians list, uh, listening, red flags there, that list might seem complex to any health professionals, certainly working in higher income countries, those data are all available at the bedside within five minutes of first seeing the patient. These are straightforward criteria. They're things that we routinely measure anyway. And we use them to empower our staff in the UK to get on and treat with the sepsis six. Now, the sepsis six is not a new guideline. It's a distillation of existing evidence-based practice. It's like any good care bundle. It's bringing the good stuff from the literature together into something memorable. And it looks like this, and it's changed over the years. We created it in 2005. It's now in use, to our knowledge, in 40 countries around the world because it empowers health professionals. So get a senior clinician on their way if such a resource is available to you. Correct hypoxia, again, if you have the resources to do so. Send bloods, including blood cultures, but also other strategies to look for pathogens, to look for organ dysfunction, and so on. Give antimicrobials, of course, but think about source control. Do I need to remove a line? Give intravenous fluid and monitor the patient. But what's important to me in any national improvement initiative is to allow variants from a pathway. These are not absolutes. We've heard about disquiet around the use of antimicrobials, admittedly among parents in that example. If a health professional in my country writes in that bot the bottom a sensible reason that they think it might be an alternative diagnosis to sepsis, they want more information, that's sensible medicine. We should empower that. We have to be conscious that things can change. And anyone who's delivering a new initiative in their own country, this is not a journey that starts in one place, finishes as another without any bumps in the road. There are always bumps in the road. And success brings challenge. Emmanuel mentioned this. We had a commissioning incentive, a financial incentive for our English hospitals to deliver better sepsis care. And the process improvement, just like we've seen in New York State, was huge. We went from 32% of patients receiving antimicrobials within one hour in 2016 through to 80% in 2019. And again, as Emmanuel has alluded to, and again, very similar outcome improvements to those seen in New York State, we saw three sequential studies. This is not cause and effect, the methodologies differed, but mortality appeared to fall using independent data from around 30% to around 20%, estimated to save hundreds, if not thousands of lives. But this brought about disquiet because it challenged professional clinical judgment and autonomy because the processes that were put in place to improve sometimes were pathway driven. And so certain individuals within the UK, and I don't, I know they won't mind me mentioning them, felt it necessary to write a letter to one of our major publications to say that sepsis is primarily a condition affecting the elderly. And again, I've mentioned New York State. The data from New York State show that almost half of the adults developing sepsis in New York State are working age. So this is not just a condition of the elderly, even in high income countries. But also the antibiotic use in emergency departments had doubled now, that would be alarming if it were true. Let's have a look at it. These are the data from our Royal Pharmaceutical Society. And they show, if you look at the left-hand column there, that antibiotic use in emergency departments from slightly prior to the incentive being put in place did indeed double. That is alarming. But if we look at the right-hand column there, the right-hand column that I'm about to highlight is total hospital consumption of antibiotics. And that did not double. In fact, it barely changed. It increased by just 1%. So what these data actually showed in England, and we've seen similar data from New York State using surrogates for this, but from Ireland using very high quality data around antibiotic use, that we can incentivize better sepsis care. It results in earlier antimicrobials, thus hopefully improving outcomes without the adverse consequence of increasing total antibiotic consumption. So I hope really now we can move forward and put that issue to bed. And I just want to finish in the final moments by talking about what we are looking to achieve at a policy level in the UK and abroad to really refine how the world thinks about infection. 
Now, I'm an intensive care clinician, like several of the speakers here. And I would suggest in a slightly controversial way that I haven't seen anyone die of AMR. I've seen lots of people die from infection that I can't treat, from sepsis caused by infection that I can't treat. And AMR has been the vehicle to bring about that treatment failure. But just as people with incurable cancer don't die because their chemotherapy has failed, so patients with sepsis don't die of AMR. They die of sepsis because we cannot treat their underlying infection. And we need to change this public message and this mindset. And that's why we've launched very recently the Infection Management Coalition, which brings about 29 recommendations for policymakers, stakeholders, and provider organizations within the UK, but which is also applicable to other countries around the world. This is funded by industry across the broad sector of industry, together with the UK industry regulators, professional societies and advocacy organizations. And at a very top level, it calls upon policymakers to stop the silos, break down the silos. We suggest and propose that there are four pillars of infections management, outbreak surveillance and pandemic preparedness, infection prevention and control, rapid recognition and treatment of time critical infection like sepsis and antimicrobial stewardship. And until we exist in a space at a policy level where we consider these four pillars together under one policy statement, we will fail to deliver to our society and our species the life-saving work in as good a way as we otherwise could. Thank you very much and very happy to take any comments or questions. Ron, thank you for a brilliant presentation and for highlighting again uh, repeatedly uh, the need for better synergies, better integration, because that's the path to saving uh, millions. And uh, I believe that uh, with Terry being on our panel today, uh, we will definitely need to follow up jointly through the different regional and national sepsis alliances and initiate the strategic dialogue on sepsis that Director General of the WHO initiated last year uh, on the margins of the World Health, uh, Health Assembly. So we definitely look forward to discussing and exploring more um, to, um, to our joint collaboration. Um, we are very limited in time. Our apologies to the audience for extended sessions, but uh, you will agree that each and every presentation and intervention has been extremely valuable and uh, important. Our next um, uh, speaker is Brett Ebenborg from the Sepsis Australia and Asia Pacific Sepsis Alliance Program Manager from the George Institute for Global Health, serving on the Global Sepsis Alliance Executive Board and bringing 35 years of experience in clinical education and management roles. Um, again, uh, my apologies for not being able to read the uh, the wealth of experience and uh, the words of the speakers without without any further ado. Dr. Abenbrook, the floor is yours. Uh, good morning from Australia. I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. And you can see my screen. Um, thank you very much. So I was asked to talk about some of the key factors that have led to our sort of low sep sepsis mortality rates in Australia. And I think the first thing is, as a caveat, is to say that uh, the mortality rates in Australia are underestimated. Um, this is because of um, poor recording and coding practices, which we are trying to address. Um, but I think when we look at the uh, the relatives um, it, within our region, at least, and in comparison to other high-income countries in our region of the Asia-Pacific, um, we actually are tracking quite well in terms of the incidence of sepsis and also around the uh, mortality level of sepsis. At a crude rate, we uh, we estimate around about 16%, but because of different changes in age and uh, other impacts, um, this this does actually vary quite considerably. So it's not this discussion isn't really about uh, the numbers of sepsis. It's more about I think about how we're approaching 
tackling sepsis at a national level. Sepsis does cost Australia a lot in terms of human life, and uh, in particular, and 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 also economically. And whilst our price tag there, you can see to society in general is about four seven four point seven billion dollars per year. Um, it is a population of only twenty five million, so it needs to be considered in in that sort of relational cost. Awareness of sepsis in Australia, despite um, a number of efforts, still remains very low. We, we've done three national surveys over the last uh, eight-year period, and uh, we've tracked against that type of initiatives that might have led to improved sepsis. But as you can see, we've really plateaued at about 60% of people that have ever heard of sepsis, let alone people that actually understand what the symptoms are. In response to the World Health Assembly Resolution, uh, which Sep uh, Australia was one of the co-sponsors for, we were... Uh, fortunate to be one of the first countries to develop a uh, national action plan in 2017. What was key to this plan was consensus. And what we, the consensus, consensus landed on was national, national coordination across sepsis activities, investment in awareness and prevention, establishing national clinical standards, and investing in community post-sepsis care and support. Out of that came 12 recommendations. And what I want to sort of really focus on here is a national standard of care that was developed. And this is what I think has contributed to, uh, to our ability to have relatively good outcomes in terms of sepsis. What we have in Australia, which I think is quite strong and we're not unique, but I think it's something that's a model that I know that I've worked with uh, New Zealand and Switzerland to assist in setting up is a very strong regulatory quality and safety model. So all of the primary care and, and acute care systems in Australia un, come under a framework of the National Safety and Quality Health Service Standards. They're a broad framework which uh, looks at governance around quality and safety, infection control and prevention, antimicrobial resistance, antimicrobial stewardship, comprehensive care, and another sort of large system type frameworks. But what sits under those are a number of specialty clinical care standards. So in Australia in 2022, we launched the sepsis clinical care standard, and this was uh, brought about through a national consensus across all of our uh, different states and territories and uh, health services, where there was an agreement to establish national standards around the recognition, the treatment, and post-sepsis care. The key to this is that this regulatory framework is actually embedded in accreditation. So as health services need to go through their accreditation process every, process every three to five years, um, they're assessed against the requirements for this standard. The standard itself is not just a, uh, a decree or a rule. It actually provides a lot of resources, um, and the resources are for health services, for the professionals, clinic professionals, and for the consumers. There are seven quality statements which are aspirational. In other words, this is where we want people to be um, focusing their attention and they have implications for, for patients and families in terms of what they can expect, what clinicians are expected to do and what health services should be providing to assist those clinici clinicians to do. The statements around could it be sepsis is around uh, having a default suspicion around um, recognising sepsis early, uh, taking lactate, taking uh, blood cultures, et cetera, within a certain time period, uh, implementing pathways, uh, using good antimicrobial stewardship in terms of um, antimicrobial therapy and having quite um, uh, strong sort of uh, metrics, if you like, around when antimicrobials are administered. There's a, long, a, a strong emphasis on coordinated care right across the patient journey and a particular emphasis on patient information. And we often hear back from our consumers and our survivors about the fact they left hospital without a, a sepsis diagnosis and therefore tried to navigate recovery without that information. And then importantly, making sure the transitions between different uh, health settings and into the community are, are, are smooth, well-informed and uh, are very structured. This is then coupled with two particular tools for health services. There's a quality indicator monitoring tool that can be used internally to look at progress towards meeting the requirements for the sepsis clinical care standard, but then also in a self-assessment tool to look at where the gap analysis is. So our health services since 2022 have had 18 months to implement this standard uh, across, as I said, primary care and acute care. 
and um, they can use this health assessment tool to see where their gaps are how ready they are to implement all the various requirements and what they need to develop from the ground up. Importantly, what we do through the quality framework is we integrate the sepsis clinical care standard with the existing framework around antimicrobial resistance and stewardship. And you can see there on the screen, the antimicrobial clinical care standard, which sets out eight quality statements, which are integrated to the sepsis clinical care standard. And I won't go through those just in because of time, but um, as you can see, they they align closely with um, good 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 antibiotic management and the types of goals that we have within sepsis for antimicrobial management as well. From that, we then draw down and, and tailor resources for sepsis that are tailored for antimicrobial uh, administration. And this is all part of a national strategy around antimicrobial management and antimicrobial stewardship. And we have an ongoing surveillance system, in, a national surveillance system in Australia, which is, a, again, a regulatory requirement of all health services to report uh, into a, a common database to look at trends in AMR and antimicrobial use, which is then fed back to the system. So I think the strength that we have in Australia is we're quite a regulated uh, health system. There's a large universal he uh, health coverage and uh, where we have uh, strong regulation quite a, um, a defined framework and integration across the, the key areas of national standards and clinical care standards, which focus on specific conditions such as sepsis. Where we are now is the National Sepsis Program. We Our, our program is not funded in sepsis, for Sepsis Australia, um, but we have had some funding from government, one-off funding. So we did phase one in 20, 2022, uh, where we were able to deliver the standard a number of the recommendations out of the National Action Plan. And we've just been fortunate enough to um, have another quantum of funding provided to then take forward the, the, uh, the next um, group of recommendations, which not only address the requirements of the National Plan, but also address the requirements that are outlined in the National Cl Clinical Care Standard that health services are required to comply with. So the last thing I'd like to say is that um, being part of the Asia-Pacific Sepsis Alliance, we have a big uh, emphasis on sharing collaboration. We recognise we have a very diverse uh, community in the Asia-Pacific from low income right up to high income. And we think the important part of that is about sharing that information. And so we, we try to set out frameworks which will assist our, um, our partners to develop their national action plan. So we have a, a guidance template to assist them and guide them on achieving um, consensus. We set out position statements of what we would consider as an emergency, as a, an expert group about what we think are uh, ex um, a minimum standards to support local clinicians when they're trying to lobby for resources and what they're trying to do in terms of proof sepsis care. We are providing a digital pocketbook of sepsis, which is free to low middle income countries, which provides uh, global expert uh, education. Um, and we, uh, tomorrow, obviously World Sepsis Day or today over here, uh, we um, have a collaborated effort around some uh, activities to raise awareness about World Sepsis. So thank you very much for um, allowing me to address the forum. Um, I've been watching for quite a while now and uh, it's been an excellent forum and I'm really looking forward to circling back and um, connecting with a number of the speakers and uh, gaining some insights from their experience. Thank you. Right. I can only echo the um, applaud uh, from the audience um, for the impressive presentation. And we look forward to learning a lot from Australia, starting from the national strategic planning processes to the clinical pathways and um, the evidence generation and dissemination. Um, our next um, presenter is Christopher Stralin, who will share another experience from the Center of Excellence in Sweden. He has been leading the working group that elaborated a national patient-centered clinical pathway for sepsis, which has been approved for the implementation throughout Sweden. Uh, Christopher is the senior consultant at Karolinska University Hospital and an associate professor at Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you clearly. Thank you. Thank you very much for this invitation. And it's a great honor for me to be 
in this meeting. So I'll continue then to talk about the key factors for the low sepsis mortality in Sweden. So the first question is, of course, is sepsis mortality low in Sweden? We have not so many studies from Sweden. Uh, here are just a few showing that about a little bit more than 15% of the patients uh, with sepsis have been reported to, to die. If we compare that with the Global Burden of Disease study, you see the Western Europe figures here. Uh, the case fatality rates was about 20% in 1990 and went down to about 15% in 2017. But of course, uh, the mortality in this part of the world is a lot lower than most parts of the world. That's important to uh, remember. But also there are many studies from uh, different parts of Europe and Northern America with, with a much higher mortality rates between 20 and 30%. However, the true sepsis mortality in Sweden is not known. Uh, the main reason is that the studies are very small and very few. And also that sepsis is clearly underestimated in the national statistics. Several studies have shown that less than 20% of hospitalized patients who fulfill the sepsis-3 criteria receive a discharge code of sepsis. Uh, the tradition is that if a patient has pneumonia and sepsis, the clinicians just write pneumonia. They forget the sepsis part. So it's uh, underestimated. So we need to improve sepsis surveillance to monitor the true burden of sepsis and to facilitate development of sepsis care. So now I will talk a little bit about the national work for improved sepsis care and surveillance. In 2019, the Swedish government allocated 90 million euros for national patient-centered clinical pathways. This is the uh, Minister of Health at that time, Lena Hallengren, who said that healthcare should be more effective and equal. So in Sweden, we have 26 different national program groups for different disease areas. One of them is infectious diseases, but there are for many other diseases, disease groups. Uh, and I'm a member of the infectious disease uh, working group. Uh, and we were asked to apply for diagnosis for patient-centered clinical pathways. So we applied for sepsis, and in our application, we attached the WHO sepsis resolution. And we, 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 we thought this was a very important message to, to, to use in the argumentation for, for choosing sepsis. So we talked about the sepsis as a global health priority and the sepsis resolution, and that the implementation of the patient center clinical pathway for sepsis in Sweden would be in line with the WHO resolution. And sepsis was selected as one of the 10 first diagnoses for patient centered clinical pathways in Sweden in 2019, together with stroke, heart failure, rheumatoid arthritis, and some other diseases. And a national working group was formed. Members were nominated by national program groups, healthcare regions, and professional societies. And this is the national working group. We were uh, 20 different persons from different areas of Sweden and uh, with different competences, infectious diseases, primary care, intensive care, clinical microbiology, surgery, emergency medicine, internal medicine, pre-hospital care, discharge coding, and also a, re a patient representative. So we started by mapping the, the a typical sepsis pathway for a patient, and the, the patient representative was very important here. Um, we looked at what happened at home and then at the emergency department, in the ward and intensive care, and then back at home again. And we mapped some challenges that we thought that we need to address in Sweden regarding sepsis. It was about awareness and knowledge that needs to be improved. The patients with sepsis are not always identified in a timely fashion, but there is variation in monitoring 
uh, patient's vital signs, that more attention needs to be paid to the patient's recovery needs, and also that a patient's sepsis diagnosis is not always registered. And we have recently published uh, this article that describes the National Patient-Centered Clinical Pathway for sepsis in Sweden. And we, we chose to focus on four different actions. Sepsis alert with management optimization in the emergency department um, uh, in a standardized way, accurate sepsis coding, and to achieve this, we have implemented an automatic SOFA score calculator uh, in one of the biggest electronic record systems in Sweden. So we will continue to implement that in all uh, record systems. And then structure patient follow-up at discharge and clinical follow-up after discharge. And this clinical pathway for sepsis was approved by Swedish authorities for implementation in May 2021. So we're currently working with the implementation process. The sepsis alert, we chose to base it on quite high levels in the, in the triage, the new, news, two, news two of seven or more, combined with clinical suspicion of infection. And recently we've uh, sent out a survey to the healthcare regions and asked about uh, how the implementation proceeds together with our patient organization, Sepsis Foreningen. And we just received this data. To what extent have you implemented Sepsis Alert? So 30% responded completely, 40% to a very large extent, 33% to a large extent, and then 7% to a small extent, and 7% not at all. So we think this has been quite successful so far. Uh, then what about surveillance? We think the surveillance is very important to, to evaluate if our clinical pathway is equal and effective, and also to know if we should change anything in the, in the clinical pathway. So we, we will, this is our goal. We will look at the patients who have actually activated the sepsis alert. Then we will also study the patients who have sepsis according to triage level. That is uh, news two of seven or more combined with infection. Because these ones uh, fulfill the criteria for the sepsis alert, but we know that many patients who fulfill the criteria do not activate the sepsis alert. So we want to know how, how many failures we have. And finally, we want to look at the full sepsis-3 population in order to be able to calibrate the system. And we will look at quality indicators, survival, hospital three days alive, up to three months, and then different process indicators regarding blood culture, lactate, antibiotics, etc. And currently, a national working group is working with the development of structures to extract these data from the electronic records. Uh, so we're very happy that, uh, that this is supported by, by the re healthcare regions. So the persons with other kinds of expertise uh, regarding the electronic record system, et cetera, uh, participate and work very uh, in a very good way with this project. Thank you for your attention. Dr. Stralin, um, we're even more convinced that we have to explore your experience in, uh, with the latest um, Swedish sepsis clinical pathways and further. And I believe that the Global Sepsis Alliance and you know, our partner um, Sepsis Stiftung would be eager to explore the possibility of additional training, maybe rounds for our member organizations to disseminate your experience further, both in the region and uh, in other geographic um, areas. And as you rightly mentioned, um, data on sepsis management is extremely limited. And even the limited data mainly comes from high-income countries that can afford 
uh, I mean, rigorous monitoring or research projects. And we literally have no or extremely scarce data in experience coming from low and middle income countries, especially the countries that are affected by um, conflicts um, like wars or other uh, emergencies. Uh, in this context, I am even more pleased to welcome our colleague Mohammed Al Fatih Ahmed, the Vice President of the Sudanese Sepsis Alliance, who will be speaking about the message from a war torn country let's work to heal and build bridges, not barriers and more pain. Mohammed? Dear esteemed leaders, I am honored to be here today to reflect the experience from Sudan Sepsis Alliance. My name is Mohammed Al Fatih, Vice President of Sudanese Sepsis Alliance. First of all, may God put mercy on the Sudanese life that we have lost during this war. And our heart go out to all martyrs who have sacrificed for our country. And we wish a speedy recovery for all the wounded and a speedy return for those missing. It's all begun on April 15, 2023, a warm summer morning. All of a sudden, a deafening expulsion rocked the air, followed by relentless sounds of gunfire. Faced with this terrifying reality, many of Sudanese families, including healthcare providers, made the decision to flee. On their journey, they witnessed armed militia individuals looting their homes on one side while a burning tree turned into ash on the other. The streets were littered with the lifeless bodies of animals, humans, and even innocent children and women. It was a heart-wrenching sight to behold. Message number one. Sepsis is just like war. It shares the same devastating consequences physically, mentally, and emotionally. Message number two. Our mindset is all that we need to make sure that sepsis war will be defeated and that we create and promote healing by providing loving care to each other. We need to envision our mindset and formulate an action plan for a future state. The future state gives a complete pulling force toward that vision. Formulate an action plan with strategic leverage intervention for pandemic prevention preparedness and response include 1. Aim to produce an understanding of the big picture of hope in order to chart a meaningful successful transformation because the greatest casualty of trauma is not only depression and emotional scar but also the loss of ability to dream and imagine another way of living. 2. Ethos Envision what we want to become and who we want to be through fostering hopefulness and optimism, which both contribute to overall well-being. Three, maintain a structure that embraces the workforce as a partner with a voice in everyday running of activities coupled with their direct participation in decision-making and progress toward the mutually agreed upon outcomes. Three, a process to ensure empowering young leaders to reach their true potential because it guarantees their readiness to fulfill their duties in the highest standard despite difficulties and challenge. Communicating through social media platforms like WhatsApp group to maintain a timely high-level engagement, achievement, and progress toward the grand plan. Refueling the workforce to keep giving and delivering. 5. When it comes to resources, it is never about having the best resources, or at least where I come from is about making the best use of available resources. Analyze the environment. Number six, to address the local and surrounding facilitators and barriers. In our case, healing fundamentally political, not clinical. Seven, governance with evaluation, monitoring the workforce's progress and goal achievements. Here I share with you a glance of what was achieved by the displaced young leaders and the title World Sepsis Healing Day. Despite the very complicated circumstances for the first time in our history, 
World Sepsis Healing Day was held in 80 states instead of one. Thank you again for this opportunity. Mohamed, thank you again immensely for taking time and joining us, especially during such a challenging time for your country. And uh, it's impressive that even in those realities, Sudan is one of the most active countries celebrating September 13 as the World Sepsis Day. So thank you for your courage, for your perseverance, for your commitment, and we look forward definitely meeting in New York and the future partnership opportunities. Uh, I was just checking uh, for some of the questions uh, on the chat. Again, we are extremely limited with, with time, so I would excuse and ask our panelists to take only two urgent questions from the audience. From the uh, online chat, we just received greetings and congratulations for the successful event from Angola, Sudan, Nigeria, Bolivia, Mexico, uh, and also uh, Peru. So we, Ecuador also, I'm sorry, I missed Ecuador. Thank you very much. We hear you, we see your messages, and we look forward to closely collaborating. And there was one request from our colleague to share the presentations from the afternoon session, and I, I believe uh, if any of you will contact the Global Sepsis Alliance or the administration or the secretariat of the, the World Sepsis Day, um, the presentations will be provided. And most probably late, later we will also upload the presentations on the main website. So this is the call for uh, like maximum two questions from the audience to our esteemed uh, presenters and speakers. Any question, comment? Emmanuel, please. Yes. And 16, I think it was, with Conrad, Tex, myself, Shevin. And it was great to see the way Sudanese Sepsis Alliance was set up. They had a Student Sepsis Alliance, Minister of Health involved, huge conference with nurses, physicians, clip pharmacists, multidisciplinary team, and um, doing really great work guidelines. So they were our flag bearers in Africa. We did our demonstrating how sepsis improvement should be, and actually flag bearers for the world, because what they were doing is actually better than most parts of the world. And um, unfortunately, as Mohammed said, with the war, is the, this work has been been devastated and people have had to leave the country or be displaced within the country the university which was really training doctors working across africa have also had to close but despite that you saw they're still celebrating world sepsis day and doing it virtually and also giving hope and healing and so they are really our heroes and i have no doubt that out of this struggle they will come back even much stronger. So it's really just to say that, and thank you, Mohammed, and the rest of the, the, rest of the Sudanese Sepsis Alliance. Thank you, Emmanuel, for, for this reflection. And indeed, it's extremely impressive what we hear and see from Sudan. Uh, I don't see any hands and questions, so let me thank Terry Reynolds, uh, Ron Daniels, Brett Abenbrook, Christopher Stralin, and Mohammed Al Fatih Ahmed for joining us as uh, the excellent uh, speakers. And thank you very much for your valuable contribution to our discussions today. And we look forward to closer collaboration. With this, I'm delighted to hand over to our new moderator for the last concluding session in the afternoon. Dr. Andreas Weyland, the Department of Human Medicine, University of Altenburg, um, representing the, the Medical University. Thank you so much for your patience, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, dear friends, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, 
I like to welcome you very warmly to the final session of uh, our meeting and uh, the, the final session will focus on uh, the role of artificial intelligence and uh, on the role of digitalization and innovative therapeutics and diagnostics. My name is Andreas Weiland and uh, from the Oldenburg University I'm the scientific uh, coordinator of the German Sepsis uh, Foundation. So, uh, we have a very, very challenging timeline now and uh, this is why I want to ask the speakers to keep, really keep in the time given and uh, at the same time I want to encourage all the, uh, the audience online to uh, put questions in the chat because we, want, we still want to keep this uh, session as interactive as possible. So, Without much further ado, I would like to uh, introduce the first speaker. This is Dr. Lukas Aschenberg. He is a specialist in orthopedic and trauma surgery. And uh, at the same time, he's the managing partner and co-founder of the company Tiplu Limited. And he will talk about the potential of artificial intelligence for the early detection of sepsis and other medical emergencies. Dear Dr. Aschenberg. Very inspiring day. I will try to stay within those 10 minutes, which is why I already see I altered the title a little bit, and I will only be talking about sepsis cases and not about other medical emergencies. Um, the general guideline is uh, for this little um, presentation um, that we ask a little bit of a question, and then we see where it takes us, and we see what further steps we can take from there. The first question that we have is how can artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms actually help to change the clinical process of any patient? And there have been quite a few studies, but all of them come to more or less the same conclusion, and we don't have to read them all, that yes, there is a little bit of evidence that yes, it can change a little bit or maybe a lot, but there is no actual clear evidence that it will change anything at all. And to already tell you, in this presentation, I will not be able to solve this question either. But there is a conclusion, and that is hinting towards there actually being quite a bit of a chance to tackle some of the challenges that we've heard about today. And uh, this little chance that there is, and to be honest, in my opinion, there's actually quite a big chance to tackle these challenges, I'm going to try to give you some input in. What is the most, what is the biggest problem? Why couldn't we, what you've seen in the slide before, why aren't there large studies on uh, the outcome, on uh, the change of clinical process, processes? The main problem is the lack of interoperable data. This is a problem in Germany, this is a problem in pretty much any other country in the world that I have talked uh, people to. And uh, the main idea is, and uh, I'm sure that hospitals in other countries can relate to that, this is how it is in Germany. You have hospital information systems that have quite a bit of raw data, but this data cannot even be compared in between the different hospitals. It cannot be compared nationally. It cannot be compared internationally. So it's very hard to conduct any kind of studies on that. So what do you need? You need an interoperable patient file so that every patient, the data of every patient can be compared. For now, I'm saying nationally. That is possible. Ideally, we're talking internationally. What I'm talking about here right now is the data of patients in the hospital, so inpatients. Of course, it would be a lot better if we had the data from all the patients. Some of us are wearing smartwatches. There's data being collected throughout the whole time that we are actually alive, or at least it can be or could be detected, uh, collected if we wanted it. And we could use all that data. For now, I'm just looking nationwide. I'm just looking at the data that is being collected in hospitals. This does not exist yet which means we do not have a research data pool that connects hospitals, not even two hospitals, that has all the data that we need. And the data that we need is ju not just billing data, is what we use in Germany, ICD codes. We need the laboratory parameters. We need the medication uh, given. We need semantics. We need to see what symptoms did the patients have. We need all this data in order to actually be able to conduct good studies on it. So what can we do? And it's a lot of work you can do go through a mapping process. You can go into every single hospital and you can map the data. You can map it to international standards, laboratory parameters, there's LOINC, there's ATC codes for medication, there's SNOMED CT. Some of you might have heard of some of these, but there are solutions is what I'm trying to say. They're just not being used. 
in most countries and definitely not in Germany. We have tried to do that and we have started some mapping in some hospitals and with that mapping we were able to create a label. Uh, we call it the sepsis label, we've done it for other um, uh, diseases too, and with that label we were trying to detect the patients within this patient data that are actually septic. Because we've heard before, um, not every septic patient is being detected. And in Germany, most of the septic patients are being later, afterwards, being detected through the billing. Uh, but the billing system is not good enough to just have an ICD code that shows that someone was septic or not. But what did we do? We looked at different uh, definitions. We took the, the uh, septis, sepsis 3 definition. We took the CDC hospital toolkit. Um, we also took some semantic analysis that we put in. Some of you might know some of these definitions, some of you might not. In general, these are guidelines or definitions how data can be used in order to determine whether or not a patient is septic or not. And we created a label. What did we do? And I'm not going through every single part of that label, just to show you a little bit uh, about the label. We looked for the ICD code, we looked for some semantics, we looked for a certain um, uh, laboratory parameters. Uh, we also looked for the SOFA score, which by the way, we have seen earlier on quite a few hospitals use that can be detected if you have the data automatically. No one has to cross any boxes on a piece of paper if you have the interoperable data. Um, we looked at other uh, semantic findings to uh, look out for uh, organ failure and uh, mecha medica, uh, mechanical ventilation and also medication given. It is a little more complicated than this and already let me give you a heads up, there will be a um, workshop in a few weeks also uh, with Professor Reinhardt where we're trying to work on this label even more to make it even better. But what did we do with this? We used this label on our research uh, data on this platform that we then created that connected several hospitals. We didn't look at just one hospital, but we looked at, in total, 140 hospitals that had the same data. That is, uh, we call it the machine learning network. It has all the data that we were talking about, and in total, it is about 10 million case files with all laboratory parameters. I don't have to repeat them again. And we use the label on this database. And what do we find? When we did this, uh, we only had 3.2 uh, million cases because we did this a while back. It takes quite a bit of time to do this. Uh, the machine learning network has grown since, so the number I'd shown you with the 10 million uh, cases was of yesterday. When we started doing this, uh, it was about a year ago, it was still a little bit smaller. But the interesting thing is the ICD findings, so the actual coded uh, septic cases were 0.78%. Uh, 25,000 cases is what we found, but our label found 40,000. So we are assuming, and there's no study done on this yet, but we are assuming that about one third of all sepsis cases is not even being detected in the hospital. We cannot prove that yet, and more studies have to be made about that, but that is one of the assumptions, assuming also that our label that we have created is correct. But we can also work on that, and I'm sure we can even make it still better working together. So in general, that is the number that I just talked about. Those are the ones where our label matched the actual um, coding, the billing code, which in the end determined the diagnosis that the doctors have given uh, the patient for billing purposes. And what you must know about German billing uh, um, uh, system, if someone is septic, the hospital gets quite a bit more money for this patient in general. So usually if someone is septic, it is not being forgotten to actually put this ICD code in for billing. And what we've done with it then, we used this network and we tried to train a machine learning system on it. So what does the machine learning system do in this? The label detects the cases, then we have a specific start, start and time. Usually we can determine that by using the laboratory parameters which have a timestamp. And then we can look at the data that has been collected 48 hours before that happened. And then the machine learning algorithm can find a pattern, what patients look like 48 hours before they actually did become septic. And that is what we then tried to do. And we created a model that has the ability to detect septic patients 48 hours before they actually become septic. But the ability, and that is actually the take home message on that chart, which I'll explain, and that's the important part. The ability of any machine learning algorithm is always being described with two numbers. If anyone ever walks up to you and says, um, 
one number. I, my machine learning algorithm has 80% um, um, precision. That is not enough. The important part is, if you want to detect every single patient, which is the recall, which you see on the bottom line, if you want to detect every single patient, all you can do is just have an alarm trigger in every single patient. You will detect every single uh, septic patient because you have triggered the alarm in every patient. You have a recall of 100%. You have an extremely low precision, though, because you have a high rate of false positives. So what you have to do in order to figure out how well your algorithm works, you have to find any spot on the red line. The red line is the average, and uh, all the other colors are the different hospitals that we've um, uh, done this training on. And you can see, if you, for example, look at the point in the middle where more or less it's 40% recall and 40% precision, that's when you can determine my algorithm, algorithm will detect 40% of all septic cases, but it will only be right in 40%. If you go further down to the right and you want to say, I want to make sure I find all our patients and you go to 80% recall, then 80% of the cases will be detected. Well, then one in five of these alarms will only be right. And that is one of the most problematic things about machine learning algorithms. It's the false positive rate. If you have too many, the doctors will not pay attention to it. If you have too little, well, it doesn't really serve any purpose because you can't detect the patients. And that is something that we are working on and that is something uh, we are trying to improve further on. But these are actual numbers what's already on, um, which can already be used. can already be used, just to give you a little bit of an input and then uh, I'm about to be done. Um, uh, there are clinical decision uh, support softwares that already use algorithms like that. They are not on the market yet, but they're, the, they're being tested. I'll show you a little bit uh, how this works. In general, you have um, what you see here on the left side um, under, it's in German, uh, the word risiko prediction, it's risk prediction. There are different predictions. There's the sepsis and it says this patient has a chance of 22.7% to become septic within the next 48 hours. And you see uh, underneath um, the little square, it says to 14 times. So this patient has a 14 times higher chance than the base patient in a similar condition, 14 times a higher chance to actually become septic. And uh, to show you what the explanation is, it's one of the important parts. That is all the data that this algorithm looks at, and from that it has detected a pattern um, that came to this conclusion. We have done in the last two weeks, so this is very, very fresh information, and this is not a scientific study, I have to warn you all, but these are just the numbers we have done. We have implemented this software in two hospitals, and we have looked at all the alarms that have triggered, uh, not in all patients in that hospital, on certain wards, um, and we were not allowed to interact with these patients. So we didn't know which patients they were, we just could look at the data, and then our doctors checked the data and checked whether or not these 83 alarms in 83 different cases were appropriate, or were inappropriate. And that gave us quite a bit of hope. It's only 83 patients for now that we've tried it on, actually tried on a lot, 83 patients where the alarm triggered. But in general, we think the further we work on that, the more this works. And coming back to the, my original statement, if we have interoperable international data, then these algorithms can be implemented in any country without much work. All they need is the data that comes in as input data, and they give out a certain uh, percentage. That is technically as simple as it is, but interoperable data is the most problematic thing uh, in healthcare um, digitalization as of right now, so therefore it will still take some time. But I think there is a chance for hope here, and this is the last thing. These two things are open, and we are very, very happy to collaborate with anyone who has ideas to work on labels, not only for sepsis, for any kind of other disease. The data network can be used for all that, and uh, we are hoping to develop more um, algorithms that can help to detect also other uh, diseases and medical emergencies besides sepsis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, also for being nearly in time. <laughs> uh, we will have the, the, the opportunity to ask questions at the end of this session. So uh, we will continue now with the next talk and we'll discuss this later. Uh, next in line is uh, Professor Beat Müller. He's a full professor for internal medicine and endocrinology at the medical faculty in Basel. And until recently, he was the head of the medical department at University Hospital Aro in Switzerland. And uh, he will talk about 
the topic biomarkers for diagnosis and adequate use of antimicrobials. Thank you very much, Alexander. Please. Thank you, Conrad, for organizing. It's, of course, uh, very humbling to be at this uh, symposium and having seen the already reported studies and in Sudan, the enormous effort you do despite a very hardship uh, situation there. So, um, antibiotics were developed at a time when we didn't have the concept of evidence-based medicine. They were usually chance findings based on anecdotal evidence in prominent person, as you see here, where sulfonylamides and penicillin were tested. Because of the severe consequences, as we saw in these patient reports in the morning and in the afternoon, of course, it's very obvious that antibiotic stewardship is important, not so much to limit because of resistance, but also to detect the cases of sepsis to be treated as soon as possible. During the host response with the invading germs, be it viral or bacterial, a ton of different biomarkers and mediators are released. Some of them we can measure, some of them we can't. Some of the most prominent which we use in daily clinical routine are C-reactive protein and procalcitonin. I will focus on my talk here on procalcitonin just because of the shortage of time we have. The concept that was developed in Basel to antibiotic stewardship was to use biomarker levels to make a probabilistic clinical reasoning. As we all know, and that's also part of the reason why these tragic cases were treated delayed, is that the clinical signs can be very ambiguous, sometimes not even existing at the final end of the disease. In pneumonia, for example, the most prevalent cause for sepsis, fever is absent in 50% of the cases. Thus, you cannot use fever as sign to give antibiotics or not. But biomarkers are a bit more dynamic and you have a clinical suspicion which is either high or low and adding to your clinical judgment you can then add biomarker levels in this case you take the limit of the dosage of 0.25 in all of the cases we saw this morning and this lunchtime with tragic consequences i can assure you the biomarker levels were far above 10 microgram per liter then you can implement this and steward antibiotic administration. To make a very long story of 15 years of research effort in several thousand patients very short at the example of respiratory tract infection, you see that the more severe the patient has a clinical disease, meaning being on the ICU and having sepsis, the more you administer antibiotics guided with biomarkers on admission, but you shorten the duration of antibiotic therapy. And the less sick the patient is, and also the less the chances of complication are, the more you can abstain from antibiotic therapy, as you see here in European and American hospitals. This can be analyzed in meta-analysis when we summarized individual patient data analysis together in collaboration with the Cochrane Library. And if you do that in compiled data of about 5,000 patients, all from randomized controlled intervention trials, you see, first of all, that you have about a 40% reduction of antibiotic exposure, which is the combination of antibiotic administration and duration, which is shortened. But even more importantly, Conrad asked me at lunchtime, do you see an effect on clinical outcome? And yes, if you do that with biomarker guidance at the example of procalcitonin, 
you significantly reduce mortality. There are many reasons for that. One of them is less antibiotic side effects, but also earlier detection and earlier administration of antibiotics, which I think is the more important one. In the sub-study, which is a prominent example in the ICU setting, this has been proven in the Netherlands. That's why I show this table or this graph. Now, of course, with all biomarkers, they're not just the one and only which decides. It still needs careful history taking, examination. Every biomarker has pitfalls. I sometimes used to compare it with a knife, a biomarker. You can cut a cake or you can kill someone. That's not dependent on the knife. That's dependent on the user. And the biomarker is just a tool which makes a good doctor better and a bad doctor worse. What we have to do is that we, in medical school and in clinical routine, we ask the local eminences, the professor, that we ask them, do you actually have evidence why you give antibiotics for this and this time? We have evidence for respiratory tract infection and sepsis, but we don't have evidence as conclusive for other infections displayed on the left side. What, however, the whole biomarker story brought to our attention is that actually less is more and shorter is more. When we started these studies at the end of the last century, the guidelines said, for example, to treat pneumonia 10 to 14 days and not shorter. If you read the guidelines today, independent of biomarkers, the guidelines now say we should treat pneumonia five to seven days. So the question is, do we actually need the biomarkers to guide it? And there I think there's still a urge to personalize medicine, that indeed there are some pneumonias which need to be treated longer and others shorter. But this needs to be proven in future trials. Thank you very much. I hope I stayed in time. Thank you very much for this uh, excellent overview, uh, considering the decades of experience you have with, uh, with these biomarkers. Uh, we will continue, and uh, the next speaker is uh, online. This is Dr. Iren Eden. He's a specialist in computer science and engineering, as well as in systems biology, and he's the founder and the CEO of the company Memet in Israel, and he'll talk about a novel host protein test to distinguish between bacterial and viral infections in patients with suspected sepsis. Please, Dr. Eden, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Very good. Great. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Professor Reinhardt and the uh, uh, organiz organizer here for the kind invitation and the opportunity to contribute. Okay, so we've heard all day about the importance of early detection and treatment of patients with sepsis um, coming to the ED. And I think it was all, it was a very tantalizing um, talk by Ilze early today, uh, a sepsis patient survivor. And several questions come to mind. Uh, two important ones is one, what is the etiology? Is there an infection? If it's an infection, is it a bacterial or non-bacterial etiology? And what is the pathogen? The second important question that we all have in mind is, well, how sick is the patient? Because that's going to impact risk, stratification, and severity. And what I want to do today is to focus on the first part of this equation. Now, early determination of etiology, bacterial versus non-bacterial, is obviously a key factor because, as again we heard all day, we're trying to balance here between two um, complementary or opposing things. The first one, we want to prevent delayed antibiotics treatment, which we know can save lives, but there's a lot of uncertainty, and we also want at the same time to try to prevent overuse of antibiotics leading to AMR. And there's another elephant in the room here called care variance or care inequity, which means the same patient coming to 
a different setting, a different doctor in a different country or a different day in the week might get a different treatment. So that's the uncertainty than the day-to-day -day reality we, we actually have to live with. And so what we have at our disposal, in addition to clinical examinations, is obviously good old cultures that are considered the gold standard, but several gaps remain. The first is time to results. We know we want to treat fast within minutes. There's the issue of inaccessible infections. We know that many times sepsis starts, for example, in the lungs, pneumonia, but it's hard to sample that site. Often, no pathogen is detected, blood cultures and also in respiratory cultures. There's the issue of colonizers that have a high degree of prevalence that also confuse the system. And lastly, even if we detect a virus, it doesn't rule out a bacterial superinfection. Other tools at our disposal include multiplex PCRs and rapid antigen tests. They're faster, but still some of these limitations remain. That's where we have traditional single biomarkers, which I really looked, listened very carefully. And, and thank you, Dr. Muller, for this super interesting uh, presentation just before, just before this one, talking about C-reactive protein that's been around for about 40 years, procalcitonin, interleukin-6, CBC, and a few others which are very valuable, but there's also gaps. CRP takes about 48 hours to reach maximal level. And we know it's a general marker for hyperinflammation. It's gonna go up not only in bacterial infections. PCT also valuable, especially for stopping antibiotics, but still there's a lot of discussions. What is the performance for initiation of antibiotics? CBC performance is probably a bit less accurate. There's a new and an exciting emerging field called advanced host response, which tries to complement the existing technologies. What is it? Well, it's based on this fundamental understanding that we can combine several multiple biomarkers together, none of which is good in itself, but hopefully the combination can provide a significant improvement in the performance. And since the first paper, one of the first seminal papers, 2008 by Octavio, Octavio Romilo in blood, which actually was the first paper that you know I read that caused me to enter into the field, there's been a tsunami of, of publications really trying to attack this problem from multiple directions, looking at the RNA, transcriptomics, proteomics, metabolomics. And the reason that there's so much excitement because, because advanced host response has the potential to really complement some of the stuff that we're seeing today, well, number one, it can diagnose inaccessible infections because the immune system circulates throughout the entire body, potentially giving you results within minutes. It's going to give you a result even if there's no pathogen that's detected. Hopefully, it can also rule out potential colonizers and identify bacterial superinfections. So there's a lot of promise. The issue was that for over a decade and a half, many publications but we have not been able to cross this chasm from publications to an actual product that can be manufactured and get FDA clearance. Recently, there's been the first FDA cleared host response technology to distinguish between bacterial and viral etiologies. It's been a, a put on a small bench of device that runs in serum and now recently received another FDA clearance for directly from whole blood, roughly 0.15 ml. And then other manufacturers are also now starting to receive FDA clearance. Second one was Diasorin on a larger machine, Beckman Coulter, and others will surely follow. I want to double click on this technology and give you a little bit of the insight there. So it's using three, to, three biomarkers. The first one is called TRAIL, it's a TNF related apoptosis inducing ligand, which goes up in your bloodstream when you have a viral infection and goes down when you have a bacterial infection. That's interesting because most of the biomarkers that we have predominantly go up in bacterial infections. Then second one, good old C-reactive protein that goes up generally in any type of inflammation and predominantly in bacterial infections. And the third one called, uh, called IP10, which is an interfering gamma-induced protein, goes up in any type of infection and predominantly in viral infections. It produces a score. It combines them using machine learning and produces a score between zero and 100 the higher the score, the higher the likelihood of a bacterial infection. Mixed infection by design will receive a high score because you want to treat the antibiotics. And there's an equivocal zone in the middle where basically it flags that it basically knows that it doesn't know. Roughly 8% of the, of the patients will fall in this equivocal zone. 
This particular technology has been validated by independent groups across the globe over a decade in different clinical settings, age, syndromes, showing pretty high performance between 0.91 to 0.98 a, a raw curves, AUC, area under receiver operating curve. And some comparisons also were done in all these publications compared to standard of care. So here you see one publication that compared the raw curve. Uh, raw curve is uh, a metric that combines sensitivity and specificity uh, here compared to say white blood count, absolute neutrophil count, et cetera. Lastly, I wanna show you some data that's starting to come out on patients with suspected sepsis and the ability to distinguish between bacterial versus non-bacterial etiology. So this is some data that came out recently on above 300 patients with age-adjusted Sears criteria. And in this particular population, it, we're seeing uh, AUC of 0 0.97, a sensitivity of 98, specificity 89, with a negative predicted value, which is critical, of 99%. Of note, there was an equivocal rate of 8%, meaning 8% of the cases, the test says that it doesn't know what the actual answer is. Here you see some comparisons to PCT. Again, not for antibiotic stopping, which I think there's a lot of promising data there, strong data there, but on antibiotics initiation, on this exact same cohort uh, for these patients with a uh, suspected sepsis. So to summarize, obviously early determination of disease etiology is a key question when managing patients with sepsis. Pathogen detection tools and traditional signal biomarkers are very helpful, but there's still gaps that remain. And advanced host response technologies have the promise and the potential to complement what we have today. And now we're starting to see fruition of all this hard work is starting to become real products. They're getting FDA clearance and European CIVD clearance. Um, so what will the future hold? Well, in this respect, first of all, now that we have these technologies available, it is critical to test them in the real world. And we were expecting more and more data coming out from real world experience and additional interventional trials are warranted and some are already uh, ongoing. Second, using this cost concept of host response based test for the risk stratification, another related but different question is also needed and there's work ongoing there. And lastly, providing this technology on multiple platforms, including those that can be decentralized using capillary blood and CLIA waiver is also an important step forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, most interesting uh, data and uh, I hope you get the time to stay in, uh, in the online, stay online uh, for a uh, short discussion at the end of the uh, session. So thank you very much again and uh, we will now head to the next speaker which is Dr. Joachim Stroke. He's a specialist in biochemistry and he's the co-founder of the company Adrenomed and head of research and development. And uh, he will talk about the topic precision medicine and new therapies for septic shock. Please. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Professor Reinhardt, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, we've heard there's definitely room for improvement um, uh, by preventing sepsis and by using antibiotics in a rational way. But clearly, we need drugs that are interventions that work when the bugs have triggered the cascade that lead to organ dysfunction and death. Um, unfortunately, the development of new drugs in sepsis has failed in the last decades. And one of the reasons identified is that sepsis is a too heterogeneous syndrome where not all patients can be successfully treated with one drug. Thus, it has been advocated since several years to define by the use of biomarkers a subgroup of patients which are likely to benefit from a treatment with a drug according to its mechanism of action. This approach is known as uh, precision uh, medicine. Recently, several compounds have been tested in clinical trials in septic shock and promising results were obtained when this concept was applied. 
as in the case of the Astonish trial and the Adrenos 2 trial. In the following, I'd like to tell you more details about Anibarsimab, its background, results gained in Adrenos 2, and future perspectives. A major driver of organ dysfunction and mortality in sepsis is the disturbance of endothelial barrier function. This can be induced by cytokines and other mediators. It leads to vascular leakage, interstitial edema, and loss of organ function. A key regulator to maintain endothelial barrier function is a circulating peptide, adrenomedulin or ADM. This has been demonstrated by the phenotypes observed for various trans transgenic mice where genes of the adrenaline system had been knocked out as well as by corroborating in vitro data. In the plasma compartment, adrenaline promotes vascular integrity by binding to receptors at the endothelium, whereas in the interstitial space, it leads to relaxation of vascular smooth muscle cells and eventually to vasodilation and hypotension. Many observational studies have shown that plasma concentrations of adrenomedulin are elevated in septic shock. This elevation is considered a counter-regulatory mechanism to combat with impaired endothelial barrier function. However, this endogenous reaction is insufficient to fix the problem. So this is why people have tried to use exogenous adrenomedulin peptide as a drug to treat sepsis. However, not unexpectedly, safety concerns arise as hypotension could be induced. Our goal has been to find a way to specifically increase the plasma activity of adrenomedulin to restore endothelial barrier function without inducing vasodilation. We achieved this with a monoclonal anti-adrenomedulin antibody, which is special in that it does not block adrenomedulin from binding to endothelial receptors and keeps it in the blood circulation. With increasing doses, as you can see on the right-hand side, the plasma concentrations of biologically active adrenomedulin increase, as shown here for phase one. Recently, another important player in the pathogenesis of septic shock has been identified, DPP3. This protease normally resides in cells, but when leaking out into the bloodstream, it degrades angiotensin II and possibly other peptides as well, which can lead to organ, function, organ dysfunction and death. Mortality increases when either bioADM or DPP3 are elevated. This is data from an observational study in sepsis and septic shock patients. 28-day survival curves are shown for patients with low and high bioADM levels on the left-hand side, in the middle for low and high DPP3 levels uh, at, at baseline. And as you can see on the right-hand side, both markers are not related. There's practically no correlation, and this tells us these markers are associated with different pathways. Thus, for defining a septic shock patient group that would benefit from treatment with any barsimab, we need to include patients with elevated bioADM because this indicates disturbed endothelial barrier function. But at the same time, we need to exclude patients with elevated DPP3 because these patients suffer from a different pathway which cannot be addressed by any barsimab. So this concept was applied in Adrenos 2, which was a European phase one clinical trial in septic shock with uh, Alex Mebaza, Pierre-Francois Latin, Peter Pickers, and Gernot Marx as principal, principal investigators. 301 septic shock patients with elevated adrenomedulin were included. Later on, DPP3 was measured and patients with elevated DPP3 were excluded in a pre-specified analysis. Two doses of anibarsimab were tested against placebo. 
as uh, results for both doses were indistinguishable, they were combined in the analysis. Anibarsimab had a favorable safety and tolerability profile. For the endpoint 20 day mortality, there was only a marginal uh, beneficial effect of anibarsimab in the full analysis set if you look at the left hand side of this slide. However, the positive effect became obvious, very obvious, when patients with elevated DPP3 were excluded. In the middle, shown with the pre-specified cutoff of 70 nanograms per ml, and on the right-hand side, when 30 nanograms per ml, the upper normal range was used. The same way the beneficial effect of anibarsimab on organ function here shown as the change of SOFA score within 24 hours after start of treatment became apparent when patients with elevated DPP3 were excluded, as you can see in the middle and the right graph. As a next step, we will now conduct, conduct a confirmatory trial, which is called BOOST, where we will apply all learnings we made in Adrenos 2 and include patients based on their BioADM and DPP3 plasma concentrations. The trial will be conducted in Europe and the US. Biomarkers will be measured locally on a point of care platform, and the primary endpoint will be 28 day mortality. In conclusion, Tailoring a patient population to a drug treatment based on its mechanism of action is key to a successful clinical development of a drug. The precision medicine approach is especially indicated in complex pathologies such as septic shock. Recent phase two clinical trials in septic shock employing the concept of precision medicine gave promising results. Based on the Adrenos 2 trial, the efficacy of treatment of the disturbed endothelial barrier function in septic shock with anivarsimab is planned to be confirmed in the BOOST clinical trial. And at the end, I'd like to thank all the clinical colleagues who have been continuously working with us with great enthusiasm on this precision medicine project. Uh, the entire Adrenomed team, and again, Professor Reinhardt for giving me the opportunity for this presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, and special thanks for being in time. We will have the opportunity for some questions uh, after the next talk, and it's my special pleasure to welcome Professor Angelos Giamarellos Bubulis. He's a full professor for internal medicine and infectious disease the Medical School of the University of Athens. And among many other functions, he's the chair of the uh, European Sepsis Alliance and chair of the Hellenic Sepsis Study Group as well. So thank, my honor. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. I would like, uh, even if it's late, to try to bring a note of enthusiasm uh, in the way to fight against sepsis. And I would like to thank wholeheartedly Professor Reinhardt for helping me throughout my career and for the wonderful two years under his mentorship at the University of Vienna. And also, I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me. Uh, this is my conflict of interest disclosure for this presentation. And in other words, from what you listened earlier on for the adrenaline study, I would like to bring you exactly the same problem. Let's make around in the ICU. Now all the pictures you can get is with masks, patients intubated, and more or less this brings us to what is happening with COVID-19. And allow me to tell you actually what I'm saying to my students. So first patient, he's male, 55, the comorbidity is hypertension, and what's the striking in his lab? An extremely high CRV and an extremely high ferritin. So I ask, the patient, the student, or the fellow, what the patient is receiving, and I get the answer. He's getting the drug A, B, C, and D, and of course everybody's happy because the A, B, and C are in the guidelines. They are the exact recipe the patient should get. Okay, let's move to the second bed. Oh, 
79, but no comorbidities. Impressive. He has sepsis. And then all of a sudden, the fellow tells, I think I made a typo. I put a coma to CRP. It's 39. It's impossible that it's 10 times less than the first patient. No, it's fully possible. But both of them are on vasopressors. Both of them are ventilated. Anyhow, who cares? They get the A, the B, the C, and the D. And the third patient, he's 50 years old, like the first one, full of comorbidities, more or less driving towards the cardiovascular comorbidity. But here you have lymphopenia. CRP is exactly elevated as the first one. And ferritin is not as highly elevated. Again, who cares? He gets the A, the B, and C, and D. I'm not against the guidelines. I don't say that the drugs are chosen by mistake. I'm just saying that we are so much impacted that we consider three fully different mechanistic, from the mechanistic point of view patients and we are similar and we treat them in exactly the same way. So, what was the good thing with COVID-19? That I'll give you two examples of how we learned from COVID-19 precision approach. The first example is, our, example is our contribution with Anakinra, and these are patients who had in their serum increased concentrations of a biomarker. The acronym of the biomarker is SUPAR, and it defines that the patient is in risk of death just because the IL-1 pathway is activated. These are the results. We compare the standard of care plus dexam, which contains dexamethasone and placebo to standard of care plus anakinra. The odds ratio demonstrates a relative significant benefit of 64%, which is immense if you compare that to the non-precision approach of other trials. And this led to the approval of the drug, both by the European Medicines Agency and by the FDA. Another major contribution which I would, although I am conflicted because I'm the PI of the Anakinra trial, it was relatively safe, the Anakinra trial, because the idea is to identify patients who are not already critically ill. For the first time in medicine, we have a successful trial for the, inside the ICU for patients who are mechanically ventilated, and actually, which is working in the approach that the more severe you are, the more, more vasopressors you get, the, more, the, 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 the worse is your lung function, the more is the benefit. The name of the, of the drug is velobelimab. It's an inhibitor of C5A. It's a first-in-class drug. So, two paradigms of precision approach. And of course, the drug received an emergency use authorization by the FDA. However, what do we mean by precision medicine? But you listened to that earlier on. You don't treat the biomarker. Treatment is guided by the biomarkers. So you need to trust the biomarker, not because the biomarker tells you that the patient is severe. We are telling to, to the relatives, the patient is severe because CRP is increased. They're not in need of the CRP to persuade them for this. The patient is in the ICU, and the ICU is only for severe patients. So can somebody tell me what's the information behind the CRP? So the biomarker needs to be able to tell you which is the pathway which is detrimental for the outcome. You need to have a drug which modulates that pathway, and you need to start treatment just because you found the mechanism. Don't time we are running against the clock. Time is important. You cannot say, oh, the biomarker is increased. I wait 24 hours or 48 hours. I go home. I think what's going on with the patient, and I go next day to give treatment. No, you need to act immediately just because the biomarker is there. So an assumption. From day zero until death, everything is red. Continuously permanently, daily, 
the patient has hyperinflammation and macrophage activation syndrome. Other patients, permanently, daily, from day zero, from the very beginning, they are on hyperinflammation. These two endotypes, if we can frame them, we can treat them. What we cannot treat? Those who are on one day on hyperinflammation, the other day on hyperinflammation, and vice versa. So what I mean by hyperinflammation? I mean that there is overproduction of IL-1-beta. IL-1-beta has a very short half-life, and it acts in an autocrine way on tissue macrophages, and IL-1-beta is deleterious in the liver, and this leads to hyperproduction of ferritin and hyperproduction of fibrinogen. The other edge. These are patients with septic shock. We screen them seriously, we collect their peripheral blood mononuclear cells, we stimulate them for cytokine production. By the way, the healthy cell should produce cytokine because it's healthy. Only diseased cells do not produce cytokine. And you see day zero, no response, if you stimulate ex vivo cells with LPS. And all of a sudden, 48 hours later, day three, the cells of survivors wake up they are in blue, they produce TNF, whereas non-survivors, everything is down-regulated. So, after our phase 2A trial provide, which we published last November at Cell Reports Medicine, we classify, in terms of endotyping of the immune system, three endotypes. Those in red with the worst prognosis, macrophage activation syndrome. Those in blue, bad prognosis, a bit better, immunoparalysis, and those in between, which we don't know what to do. And allow me now to share with you a vision. Your ferritin is increased, not increased, skyly high increased, more than 4,420 nanograms per ml. And if this is the case, you may call that macrophage activation syndrome, and we suggest the inhibition of IL-1 as a treatment. Ferritin is down, but also HLA, the iron monocytes is down. This means immunoparalysis. Try to wake up the cells, administer recombinant interferon gamma, and for patients who are in between, we don't know what to do. And allow me to present you the Immunosep Consortium, a consortium which has been funded with 10 million euros by Horizon 2020, a consortium from Germany, Greece, Italy, the Netherlands, Romania, and Switzerland. And the goal is to do a double blind, double dummy, randomized clinical trial in the most severe patients with either macrophage activation syndrome or immunoparalysis from lung infection or primary bacteremia. And for the first time, we do not randomize by drug. We randomize by strategy. The strategy of precision immunotherapy or the strategy of placebo immunotherapy. In other terms, in the red arm, patients with macrophage activation syndrome, they receive IV and Akinra and DAMI, sub-Q placebo. If they are on immunoparalysis, they receive sub-Q recombinant interferon gamma and DAMI placebo. And the endpoint is the change of SOFA score and the study is powered for 280 patients. And now someone may ask, can this be real? Can we do that? Can we screen patients in daily practice? Yes, we do. We have screened so far 510 patients. We have enrolled 197. We are 83 to go. And we hope that this day, next year, we will have something really promising in hand. Thank you very much for this kind invitation. Thank you very much uh, for this, well, really, these insights and ongoing studies and this exciting uh, data on precision medicine. We have now the possibility to ask uh, questions. And uh, first of all, I would like to ask the audience if there are any questions to the speakers. And, uh, in parallel, I'll have a uh, look at the chat uh, questions. We see most of the chat questions have, have been answered by the slides too. Um, well, first, from my side, I would like to know, yes, Conrad, 
you, you can, no, no, you can ask first. Go ahead. I had a quick uh, comment or okay. question also. Yeah, but go ahead. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it crucial that uh, anakinra can, can only be used in, in uh, uh, patients with a macrophage activation like syndrome? Or what, what would happen if you give anakinra to a patient who, ha who has no mo uh, macrophage, uh, macrophage uh, activation like syndrome? Well, uh, you understand that I cannot answer any of these questions. I can only do hypothesis. Yeah. I can answer the questions only when we have data. Uh, the concept was for precision immunotherapy. This does not mean that there are patients who have ferritins between 1,000 and 4,000 and who could get benefit. The reason why the cutoff for ferritin is so high is because for the needs of a trial, it provides a specificity of 100% for diagnosis. In other terms, you do not risk to enroll the wrong patient. Okay. That's the idea. Yeah, thank you very much. But in, in total, the, the incidence of the macrophage uh, activation-like syndrome was, I said, there were 30 patients from 100. So thank you screens. again very much for this great question. Our data claim that the overall incidence is 6%. You know very well that data coming from Charité, they speak for the same, and also data from the American Process Study, they give that to 7.2% of overall sepsis patients under mechanical ventilation and vasopressors. Thank you very much. Conrad. Uh, again, I have a question to, to you because there were several arguments that trials in sepsis have failed, one indeed was that we could not identify the right immune status and some might be harmed. But another issue was also the timing of antimicrobial, uh, of, of, of the immune response because it's hyperinflammation often in the very early phase and we had time windows of up to 36 hours which allowed to treat them with anti-TNF uh, and the many uh, immune modulatory or suppressive therapies. On the other hand, you have shown now this exciting data on C5A inhibition, where the inclusion criteria was, I think, 12 hours after the first uh, sy symptoms. And I, I wonder, and, and, and it was amazing effects. And, and I, I wonder how this concept fits in this great concept not to treat immune suppressed patients with immune suppressives, which most of the compounds we have used so far have been. So you got the question, it was surprising to see that obviously the timing is and the likelihood that these patients are still hyperinflammatory, and this is a kind of also precision medicine. And I just wonder whether you would elaborate somewhat at this. And it, okay, so that's that's my 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 question. Well, you are absolutely right. Time is very important. Uh, unfortunately, I am afraid that we were obliged to do a similar, I don't know if it's a mistake or not, but in order to get the grant, uh, the trial was reviewed by the European Medicines Agency and their advice was to enroll patients the first 72 hours from start, from the first signs of infection. Uh, the data so far demonstrate that the majority of the patients, they start treatment the first 24 hours. So if this holds true, then we start early. But I fully agree with you that 12 hours would be ideal. And also, if I was aware of the large efficacy, spectrum of efficacy of ilomelibab, there is no doubt that it's, in my opinion, it's much more promising than an akinra for these patients with hyperinflammation. Thank you very much. Is uh, Dr. Eden still online? Yes. Great. <laughs> Other question. Uh, you showed the excellent sensitivity and specificity of this uh, uh, test to detect bacterial uh, infection. Um, 
you used three biomarkers. So if you use five or 10 or 20 biomarkers, will the sensitivity uh, further increase? Or, or with other words, how many biomarkers uh, make sense to combine with machine learning? Thanks for this question. Um, we actually tried, we and others have looked at this question for several years and published a study. This was a 2009 to 2013, where we ran what was at that time the largest proteomic screening of the human response to acute infections. So thousands of proteins, over 1,002 patients. And then we plotted this graph saying, well, how much extra juice do you get by adding more biomarkers? And surprisingly, we found this surprising simplicity where once you reach three and maybe four, you have a diminishing return on investment, meaning more biomarkers didn't give you more performance. It's surprising because, you know, we would expect, we were expecting something much more complicated, but that's actually what the data showed. One reason for that could be that there's also a limit to the performance to, that, that we can actually achieve in these type of tools because we're worth working against an imperfect reference standard. At the end of the day, the only way you can know if it's a bacterial viral etiology, we don't know, we don't have a gold standard, is to run all available tests in, that we have in 21st century medicine, combine them, and then have expert adjudicators. So I think there's also a theoretical limit to how well you can actually perform uh, that's also driving this, I would say, stop at around three, three biomarkers, three to four biomarkers. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a, a question which is related to, to this test to, to Professor Miller. Uh, you, you showed, and we, we know that uh, the PCT can be used to shorten the uh, ex uh, antibiotic exposure. So, will it perhaps, if the combination of three biomarkers makes sense in detecting an infection, may it uh, may it also make sense to to uh, end uh, antibiotic treatment by not by a single biomarker like PCTs, but also by a combination? So I think that's an open question. We don't have the data on that yet. Most of the focus uh, has. Excuse been... me. This this was, this was a question to Professor Miller. <laughs> uh, you you can finish your sentence. Maybe I concur. <laughs> No, please. I, I thought it was, it was about it was about the the signature itself. No, but but I was just saying that the signature was not tested in that realm, only the initiation. So, but please go ahead. Um, so, uh, in principle, I concur. Um, I think what is very challenging and was very nicely seen by the development of the talks, actually, that I actually am a strong believer also to treat pathways and not just unspecifically. I think that's what we should do and to improve, and that were the limitations. Now, if you add more biomarkers, you might be able to distinguish them better. But in the end, we can have so many hypotheses, we just need the randomized controlled trial. And when I personally see receiver operator curves showing biomarker A and biomarker B, independent of my bias, but why do we limit observational studies? Just do the intervention and try it and then just withhold antibiotics with parameter A, B, C as compared to parameter X, Y, Z, and then we see it. I think that's what I urge any biomarker developers just to do the intervention trial. Until then, it's just speculation on a high level. Thank you very much. Conrad, you have got a comment? Um, I wanted to ask you, so it was my understanding Hospital, we have implemented the use of chloroplasticity in a wide range. I think you know how the hospital will work, or you have been at least one of the first adopters. And I just wonder whether you had a notion on whether there was over impact on the overall use of antibiotics, but even more importantly, on the outcomes in your specific environment. Yes. Uh, we were a strong advocate of using it as it was used in the trials. 
Meaning, for respiratory tract infection, yes, absolutely, we can show the data and we also made international comparisons. The challenge with all these biomarkers is that they're then widely used for all other things. So the orthopedic surgeons use it, the surgeons use it, the, uh, anybody uses it in any situation. And there's a cannibalism between clinical diagnosis and use of biomarkers. And so due to that, I'm reluctant to say, yes, indeed, we introduced it. So it's feasible to introduce it. Mortality didn't increase for sure. Whether we also reduced mortality overall in this hospital setting outside of, of a controlled trial, I'm just a bit reluctant to brag about that. I'm a strong believer of firm evidence and not to pin my bias, which of course says it did reduce it, but without having the data, I think it's dangerous. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've got a, another question with, uh, which is also related to, to PCT, um, to, to Dr. Struck. Um, we, we, uh, we know from a secondary analysis of a PCT trial where the uh, adrenomedulin uh, concentration have been monitored, that in patients, despite a decrease in PCT, where we usually stop antibiotic uh, treatment, they, uh, had, they had a very high mortality if they had high pro-adrenomedulin uh, levels. Does this mean that we, even, uh, that we should always combine PCT with adrenomedulin in the future, perhaps, or does uh, this mean we should... Uh... Well, I, I would go with Bea to say, use these markers to do a mechanistically linked intervention, right? So if there's elevated PCT, this indicates an ongoing bacterial infection, and so you need to do antimicrobial therapy, whether it's antibiotics or mm. uh, washout or whatever, eradication. If adrenaline levels or mr m levels um, continue to uh, be high, this indicates disturbed endothelial barrier function. Right. And this, in consequence, would mean, and I told you we are in the process of doing the clinical trial, These so are there's two no entities. definite proof, One but is the inf if infection. this is elevated, then you would go with the adrenaline antibody to treat this aspect, because it's different things that we're looking at here, okay. and it needs different interventions. Thank you very much. Do we, uh, we have the, in, well, I have another question, perhaps, Dr. Sh yeah, sorry. So we're just asking whether the uh, injury or the operation yeah. may have a confounding effect, giving, let's call it not real, but sub, uh, uh, yeah. un un uh, under, no, high, hyperestimated levels of bio-ADM yeah. and lead to erroneous results. That's our concern. Yeah. So I have to say that I, I mean, I shortened very much what, what I told you, uh, because I mean, there's a long list of in and exclusion criteria, clinical laboratory, in addition to the biomarkers. Okay. On that, like elevated SOFA score and other things. Yeah. So already on that, we would uh, shrink, you know, the uh, patient population. Um, Generally speaking, any elevation of bio-ADM, and in whatever indication, you can go broader. You can go dengue fever, high altitude sickness, heart failure, indicates disturbed endothelial barrier function. So in this sense, there is no false positive. It's just we are not in the silos anymore that we used to think in, yeah? It, no, I would not say it's a compounder. Okay. I think, uh, yes, Conrad, uh, yeah, uh, what, I, one I, last I, comment. I, uh, no, no, not a comment, uh, but I, I have an interesting comment and question to our presentation from our colleagues from Deep Blue, because I was intrigued by what you have demonstrated, because you, you, you are, you are, seem to be able to bring with your approach together lab data with other documentations uh, like uh, patient records, which so far was not possible in countries which have not systematically 
introduced electronic health records. And I have, we have complained and suffered under this situation in comparison to the US, who had started this process 10 years ago, and now I think perhaps 90% have electronic health records. And, and what you have demonstrated, I think it's very promising, not only in this terms of early detection, which is one aspect of this, but also to have a better understanding of the true and real burden of infections, because using electronic health records in the US demonstrated with 400 hospitals that indeed what you have shown, that only one third of the patients in the US have been documented by the ICD coding, despite the high importance of billing. And there were claims, and some people talked about sepsis hysteria due to billing and not to the real thing. But when the trial was done, it was obviously that it was grossly underestimated. And I think this is a great chance and idea if so far already so many hospitals have it in Germany that we really can make a, a big step forward. That's my comment and perhaps question. And I wonder when you feel to be able to come up with this not only 3 million uh, patients, but with this 10, 10 million uh, uh, analysis. Well, thank you very much. Do you, do you want to comment on this? Thank you very much. These are exciting perspectives uh, in artificial intelligence and in precision therapeutics and precision uh, diagnostics. I would like to thank all the speakers uh, for their excellent talks and uh, for being in time, despite the challenging timeline. <laughs> and uh, I would like to thank the sponsors of uh, this, uh, this event for supporting, so supporting us. And it's my pleasure now to hand over to uh, Mariam Yashi uh, to end the session and uh, to present the Berlin Declaration. Thank you, Andreas. Um, and thank you for all the speakers and contributors to this truly remarkable event. And while discussing the preparations for the Central World Health Sepsis um, event in Berlin, um, the proposal emerged that it would be a great missed opportunity if we are really serious about reinvigorating the action globally against sepsis to conclude this meeting without an important outcome document. The document that could be used as a new roadmap for the stronger global action on sepsis. So I have the honor to present the highlights of the Berlin Declaration on Sepsis, and each of you have um, a copy of the printed declaration. We are excited to um, note that yesterday, when the declaration was printed, only 64 organizations were listed among the first signatories of the organization. And as of today, we have over 70 international organizations joining us in the Berlin Declaration, including the Clinton Health Access Initiative, CHAI, that is one of our new and extremely important partners in the fight against um, sepsis globally. Um, the declaration, of course, starts with um, acknowledgement of the progress that has been made against the fight in sepsis, including adoption of the historic WHA resolution in 2017. Um, 16 countries who have evidence that they have prioritized sepsis in their national strategies, policies, or initiatives. Um, adoption of the World Sepsis Declaration and 
signing of the declaration by over 14,000 individual and institutional stakeholders globally, generation of paramount, uh, paramount evidence on the global burden of sepsis, first published by Lancet in 2020, along with the first global sepsis report from WHO that followed the same year, 2020. Establishment of five regional sepsis alliances under the umbrella of the Global Sepsis Alliance that brings together 120 member organizations, an annual commemoration of the World Sepsis Day since 2012, and today is another brilliant commemoration of, um, of the World Sepsis event with official uh, World Sepsis Day um, to be um, uh, celebrated by our member organizations globally on September 13. For each of the data and figure, you can find relevant evidence in the reference section of the document. However, despite the progress that we have achieved jointly, and the paramount scientific evidence, still sepsis remains as a major global health threat, accounting for 20% or one in every five deaths globally. It has affected almost 50 million people and uh, claimed 11 million lives of children and adults only in 2017. And the latest data show that the annual um, death is accountable to sepsis by maybe even higher, up to 13 million. Five million sepsis-related deaths uh, are attributable to underlying injuries or non-communicable diseases. So we have increasing evidence, the growing evidence that sepsis is definitely not the most common um, kind of end pathway um, to deaths from infectious diseases. Most of the 14.9 million cases, um, ex excess deaths that was reported by WHO during the pandemic was attributed to viral sepsis. High economic burden of sepsis is still alarming, as, ma as well as the status quo that less than 10% of uh, the WHO member states have prioritized uh, sepsis in their national policies and strategies or two concrete actions for enforcement of the WHO resolution. Most importantly, realizing that the health-related sustainable development goals, along with the associated universal health care, the pandemic prevention prepared in response and antimicrobial resistance would not be achieved unless we prioritize sepsis and strengthen the global sepsis response at all levels. Policymakers rightly prioritizing AMR, including at the G7 and G20 dialogue platforms, have to equally prioritize and address sepsis in the high level political forums and dialogues at the ultimate pathway to deaths from infections untreatable due to the antimicrobial uh, 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 resistance. And finally, improved prevention, early diagnosis, and timely treatment of sepsis contributes to strengthening holistic and patient-centered national health services. So against those, the, the background, <clears throat> this, the progress made, challenges remaining, and the reality that without addressing sepsis, we would never be able to, to attain sustainable development goals. We call on the UN member states to ensure urgent and full-scale enforcement of commitments declared in the 2017 sepsis uh, resolution. And the bullet points and the action uh, points are exactly the same as listed in the 2017 resolution, calling for including sepsis in the national health system strengthening initiatives, both for healthcare settings and community level interventions, developing standard and optimal care and strengthening sepsis management in health emergencies, Number three, increasing public awareness, followed by developing training for all health professionals on infections, uh, prevention and control, and patient safety, and more importantly, communicating with patients, relatives, and other parties using the term 
sepsis. Finally, the member states are urged to promote research for innovations, including research for new antimicrobials, uh, alternative medicines, rapid diagnostic um, tests, vaccines, and other important technologies. The Berlin Declaration also calls and requests the WHO Director General to ensure oversight on full-scale implementation of the following articles of the 2017 WHA resolution. To develop WHO guide guidance, including guidelines on sepsis, and today we're extremely um, delighted to hear from Dr. Tedros that the guidelines will be developed next year, and we had a uh, very comprehensive presentation on the uh, planning process for the uh, development of the guidelines. WHO Director General is also requested to support member states to define standards and establish the necessary guidelines, infrastructures, lab capacities, strategies and tools for reducing the sepsis burden. And finally, to collaborate with other organizations in the UN system partners, international organizations, and other stakeholders in enhancing access to quality, safe, efficient, and affordable types of treatments for sepsis and IPC, including immunization. Number three, we call on key stakeholders in global health. That includes UN member states and UN specialized agencies, B and multilateral development agencies, public-private partnerships and philanthropies, leading philanthropies in the global health arena, including Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Clinton Health Access Initiative, Gavi Vaccine Alliance, the Global Fund, Rockefeller Foundation, innovative financing platforms, business sector, academia, professional associations, and civil societies to urgently prioritize sepsis in the global health architecture and high-level advocacy forums, including at World Health Assemblies, UN General Assemblies and um, related side events, World Health Summit, Davos Economic Forum, G7 and G20 Dialogue, as political and financial investments remain disproportionately low to the human and economic burden of sepsis, especially if we compare to other equally important and priority communicable diseases. We also call the key stakeholders to urgently prioritize development of global and national sepsis strategies and action plans within the holistic policies for IPC, universal health care, AMR, or the pandemic, preparedness, and ensure synergy of policies and actions. We call for establishing regular monitoring and reporting mechanisms for the enforcement of the WHO sepsis resolution and strengthening data collection and surveillance systems for sepsis. At the same time, the key stakeholders are called for elaboration and promotion of the second resolution for the World Health Assembly that we hope could be submitted to the 78th session of the Assembly. Uh, with more specific and measurable targets and with a call for WHO to prioritize sepsis in its organizational structures at all levels, call for synergies and policies and actions for sepsis, universal health coverage, AMR and the pandemic record, uh, uh, accord, and to recognize the World Sepsis Day as the 14th official Global Health Day of WHO. We also call for ensuring increase in sustainable funding for sepsis through domestic funding, international aid, health system strengthening portfolios of the global public-private partnerships and innovative financing platforms. We prioritizing establishment of country-led coordination mechanisms for the design and implementation of national sepsis strategies and ensuring establishment of the global academic network for generating, consolidating, and disseminating uh, proven and emerging evidence, knowledge, and innovations for sepsis. Finally, we call on G7 and G20 leaders, the building on the example of the 2022 Berlin communique of the G7 health ministries, 
to intensify efforts for detection, diagnostics, and therapy of sepsis, to synergize sepsis responses with antimicrobial stewardship and IPC, and ensure increased and sustainable funding for reinvigorated global action on sepsis. I'm using the opportunity to thank you once again and to call our partners globally to um, look at the Berlin Declaration on the Global Sepsis Alliance website. And if you are intending to endorse the document, you have relevant um, uh, information to contact us. And any organization active in the field of sepsis or infectious disease um, area or AMR or pandemic, global health activities, uh, activists around the world, you are welcome to join on behalf of your organizations. And we hope that Berlin Declaration will not only receive um, expanded um, support, but it will become a realistic roadmap for reinvigorating the global action and really starting a new global agenda for sepsis. The declaration will be presented next week at the first side event on the synergies of sepsis, AMR, universal health coverage and pandemic uh, record within the margins of the UN General Assembly in New York. Thank you once again for your attention and it has been an honor to become the part of uh, the Global Sepsis Alliance. Thank you. Just let me close this meeting, and I think it was another historic step in the fight against sepsis. And our intention to bring this with our new leaderships, both for the Sepsis Foundation and also the Global Sepsis Alliance, <clears throat> I'm pretty sure that we will bring the fight against sepsis on the next level and to get at equal footing with other global health threats. And this is what, what it was all about and all in the room and all in the internet who are uh, with us now can be proud of this next step. And uh, as discussed and uh, called for, I'm pretty sure that we make uh, hundreds of supporters for this resolution and if we already now, with less than a week, had close to 100 uh, supporters as first signal. Thank you so much and enjoy with us a drink uh, downstairs and with some food. So it was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, yeah, that's it. And until La Lotta Continua.